In the year 2007, a fairly small-time Ukrainian video game studio called GSC Game World, the GSC being a transliteration of its founder's initials, Grigorovich Sergei Konstantinovich, who up until that point were mostly known for making the real-time strategy series Cossacks, dropped Stalker, Shadow of Chernobyl, a tactical first-person shooter set in an alternate version of the Chernobyl Exclusion Zone. And although it would drop in the same year as legendary staple your nutsack to the ceiling high-budget AAA FPS titles such as COD 4 and Halo 3, Stalker's realistic and brutal gunplay and its gripping setting and atmosphere would allow it to roll with these big dogs, and its legacy on the FPS genre is still very felt to this day, with Stalker's atmosphere and gameplay turning into the granddaddy of wildly popular tactical shooters like Escape from Tarkov, and the game still enjoys a thriving modding scene that adds so many new mods, weapons, and animations, they're making brand new games out there. And up until about a week ago, I was just casually ignoring this legendary series, as I was reluctant to play it as the outdated engine and seemingly brutal and plotting gameplay were not very enticing to me as an outsider looking in. But I decided to give it a go after a few commenters requested I take a look at this series, and after completing Shadow of Chernobyl, Clear Sky, and Call of Pripyat, I'm extremely glad I decided to give it a try. Stalker's got the sauce, and it's one of the most unique FPS experiences I've ever had, and I've been gunning down digital opposition since I was a shitheaded 12 year old playing Black Ops on my Xbox 360. So today, I thought it would be cool and fun, again, to take a look at each game in the series and review it the only way I know how, poorly. For this video, I'll only be taking a look at the three mainline games in the series, with as few mods as possible. The only exception to this rule being the Zone Reclamation Project for Shadow of Chernobyl, the Shadow of Chernobyl's engine is about as stable as the damn zone itself, and it makes the creation engine look cutting edge by comparison. And even with ZRP installed, I still ran into a few hard crashes anyway. And before you ask, I am also aware of the popular stalker mods Gamma and Anomaly, but those are out of the scope of today's video. But hey, if this video does well, I will absolutely take a look at those mods in the near future, because I kind of want to check it out for myself. But for now, we're sticking with the trilogy as GSC Game World gave it to us. And also, another quick note, massive spoilers for the plot of all three games. So if you don't want to get spoiled, go play this game and come back here. And if you don't want to play this game and just want to learn about the story and world, I've got you covered too. But I still highly recommend that you at least play Shadow of Chernobyl. And now that I'm done yapping, let's waste no more time and crash a death truck right into the zone and take a look at Stalker, Shadow of Chernobyl. Okay, so to understand the story of Stalker, it's time for some lore. My favorite. The Stalker games take place in an alternate timeline where a second disaster occurred near the Chernobyl nuclear power plant in 2006. The 1986 Chernobyl meltdown still occurred the same as it did in our world. You know, the Soviets you forgot how to it. boil water, Reactor 4 melts down, the world's most radioactive goop pile is created, and the rest is history. Stalker's story and setting are based on the novel Roadside Picnic by the Strugatsky brothers in the 1979 Tarkovsky movie of the same name with Roadside Picnic being the origin of the zone in the Stalkers, and the film being a major inspiration for the theming of remote Soviet-style dereliction and some of the mechanics of the game, most notably throwing nuts and bolts to safely detect anomalies. But Stalker is not a one-to-one -one adaptation of these pieces of media, as the game tells its own original story surrounding the Chernobyl zone. As in Roadside Picnic, there are several zones across the entire world, and they are all alien in nature, with the artifacts and anomalies implied to be leftover alien items and technology as if the aliens left behind their trash after stopping on Earth for a roadside picnic, if you will. And humans are unable to comprehend the nature of the aliens' leftover trash, as if they were ants trying to comprehend what items humans would leave behind after a picnic on the side of the road. It's an absolutely killer concept. And also, the main character's daughter turns into a monkey. In the game, however, it's unclear at the start if the zone is alien, man-made, or caused by some other phenomenon. But across all three pieces of media, the things they have in common are the zone, the stalkers, and that the center of the zone contains an artifact or area that is rumored to have the ability to grant the wish of anyone who finds it, which I'll talk more about later. But back to the game's story. This second incident formed what we know as the zone, a mysterious area encompassing the Chernobyl exclusion zone where space, time, physics, and biology seem to have become unnaturally warped, which created anomalies all across the zone and spawned dangerous mutant creatures. And this is already on top of the latent radiation from the 1986 disaster, so the zone is a real shithole. However, these anomalies also created the artifacts, mysterious objects that can improve its owner's abilities, such as making them more resilient to environmental hazards, to increasing their strength, to even shielding its owner from radiation. These artifacts became highly valuable and sought after, which prompted the first stalkers to enter the zone in search of them. Despite the extremely dangerous nature of the zone itself, and risking getting clapped by the military, who hold a loose at best control over the zone. And as time passed, more and more stalkers began flowing into the zone, giving rise to unique factions within the zone itself, 
creating its own self-contained stalker society. Which brings us to the start of Shadow of Chernobyl. Shadow of Chernobyl opens with a low resolution cutscene of a truck driving through a dark and stormy landscape, carrying several bodies in its trailer, with one jump scaring us with a fucked up zombie face. The truck is then struck by lightning and explodes. We then cut to an unnamed stalker finding the truck wreckage. He checks the bodies for loot until he comes to us, and is shocked to find us still alive. And he makes an odd comment about dreams. His death would have saved him from the dreams. And then picks us up, planning to take us to someone named Sidorovich. This guy is a real class act. He carried our body on his back for who knows how long instead of doing the much easier act of just leaving us to die. So get a good look at him, as we never see him again in this game or in any of the other games. <laughs> Chad Behavior shows up, saves our life, doesn't elaborate, and then leaves forever. <laughs> he takes us to Sidorovich's bunker, who is eating a nasty 2007 graphics chicken leg. Old Sid here is shocked that we survived the death truck crash and inspects our PDA, which only has the message Kill the Strelok. Our character then jerks awake and snags his PDA back, revealing that he has the acronym STALKER tattooed on his arm. STALKER standing for scavengers, trespassers, adventurers, loners, killers, explorers, and robbers. Which, yes, we currently are a STALKER. That'd be like if I got unemployed tattooed on my arm. We then fade into the game proper, and we get our current working name from Sidorovich, the marked one on account of our tattoo. We have amnesia, not knowing our name or where we came from. The only thing we know is that we have to find and kill someone named Strelok, which, fun fact, is literally Russian for shooter or gunman. Sidorovich is kind of like our dad in this game. He gets us started with starter missions and is a very helpful trader in the early game. He shows us our PDA, which has the map info, quests, logs, and so on, everything a menu needs. But my only complaint about this PDA is the map is a bit unwieldy, and the map screen is slightly too small for my liking. Later games improved the PDA's map, but it took me a while to figure out just how to zoom out, as you can't just use the scroll wheel to zoom in and out. That's way too easy. Rather, you have to select the zoom in or out button, and then click the screen to zoom out. And having to recenter the map after traveling between areas was a bit confusing at times. But besides this rather clunky map, the PDA has everything we'd ever need, and it even has a sort of stalker social media that shows you nearby stalkers, and even has a scoreboard for them. But I didn't really engage with this too much, as it mostly serves to show you who's affiliated with who, and who wants to murder you or not. And unless you're playing like a real prick and pissing off the neutral factions, you'll mostly be fighting bandits, mutants, the military, and later the monolith. But with the PDA tutorial complete, Sidorovich gives us our first job, to find a stalker named Nimble and obtain a flash drive from him, and points us to the local stalker boss man Wolf to help find Nimble. We can then strike out into the game proper. Good hunting, stalker. First things first, for a game that came out in 2007, I still think this game holds up extremely well graphically, even without too many mods. Sure, the weapon models look pretty dated and polygonal, and the animations are stiff and you move with this awkward sway that will take a few minutes to get used to, and the character models got a bad case of Morrowinditis. But the foliage and decrepit long abandoned Soviet villages and structures still look great, and the atmosphere and world design have some god tier execution, and the lighting systems in these games are phenomenal and really help to make the game look even better than it is, which we can see more of later on. This game has the ability to suck you right in with its familiar yet totally alien zone, which the NPCs extend to great effect. Watching them sit around the fire, play guitar, and crack jokes, at least I think they're cracking jokes, I'm not really sure what these guys are saying. Seeing sights like this really add a sense of human comfort in this extremely hostile zone, and it adds so much to the immersion of the zone, which is bolstered by some awesome sound design. As you embark out into the cordon, ominous and unnatural music drones in the background, broken up by the sounds of ravens cawing, wind blowing through the trees, your footsteps, and your PDA indicator beeps, and other mysterious sounds and disembodied groaning noises generated by the zone. It's super immersive and scary. But that's not to say the audio is perfect, however, as a few sound effects sound pretty aged and awkward, especially this whooshing sound your character makes when switching through weapons and equipment. I think it's supposed to be the sound of the marked one holstering and unholstering his weapons, but it sounds like he's ripping through time and space as he pulls his AK out at 400 miles an hour. Also, 
At least in the English dub, the voices aren't mixed super well, and a few times I had a hard time hearing NPCs during cutscenes and conversations. And finally, this is just a personal nitpick, but it was very funny to me how many voice characters wouldn't even try to follow the on-screen text. They were still saying what the text says, just worded completely differently, seemingly for no reason. A stalker by the name of Fox is coming back from a raid. Looks like he had a rough time and needs help. He came back with some type of critters all over him. He says he won't last long. He just might know something about Strelik. You gotta go see him right now. Here are his coordinates. Maybe the text is a direct translation of the original Ukrainian text? But the voice actors are reading off a different localized script? I'm not sure. But I thought it was pretty funny, and I didn't really mind it. And if anything, it makes the game more charming to me. But with looks and sound out of the way, we talk to Wolf to learn more about Nimble. The dialogue system in this game feels more like a streamlined version of Morrowind's, where you can talk to some, but not all NPCs, and you can ask them for information, jobs, trade with them, or advance a quest line if need be. And it serves its purpose well enough. I've got no complaints. We ask Wolf about Nimble, and Wolf tells us that Nimble and his buddies were jumped, shot up, and left for dead by bandits in a nearby car park. The marked one then gets a bit snippy with Wolf before Wolf asks us to meet up with a few of his guys to go find Nimble. So we head on out, armed with only our PPM starter pistol. Along the way, I rescue this dying stalker with a med kit to make my first zone buddy, which is a mini tutorial on reputation with the other stalkers, which is pretty simple. Do right by a person or faction by rescuing them or completing quests for them, and they will like you, and their dot on the minimap will turn green. And they can offer you additional info or better deals when trading. But I didn't really worry about reputation too much during my playthrough, as I remained mostly neutral with all factions besides the wholly hostile ones, and I was lone wolfing it for most of my playtime. We then meet up with Wolf's men, who are scouting the bandit camp, and we move into attack, where we get our first combat encounter. Stalker's combat is, in my opinion, its strongest aspect. Stalker's gunfights are probably the closest I've gotten to a real-life gunfight in a game. They're fast and brutal, especially on the master difficulty. And getting into a gunfight is a conscious decision you'll have to make, as you'll need to expend your ammo and medical resources to come out on top against a group of enemies. Getting shot usually means you'll start bleeding, which you'll need bandages or a med kit to stop. But the bleeding system is fairly forgiving in this game, so I usually had a comfortable stockpile of bandages on hand, and only one or two were needed to completely stop a severe bleeding. This is a completely different story in the next game though. Just wait. Now there is some controversy surrounding the difficulty. Ask any stalker player what difficulty you should play on, and you'll get conflicting reports that usually go along the lines of, Master difficulty is the best and only way to play the game. It gives bullets realistic damage to you and your enemies, and a headshot is pretty much 100% lethal with any weapon, unless your opponent has some serious head protection. Now I agree that you should play the game on Master Difficulty, as it seems the developers designed and built the game around the Master Difficulty being the intended difficulty. But even on Master Difficulty, the enemies are pretty bullet spongy if you aren't getting headshots on them. Even the low level bandits armored in hoodies and weed branded sweatpants can take half a clip or more of bullets to the stomach without dying. Which probably made some players think that their bullets were vanishing or doing no damage at all, when in reality they just didn't realize that bandits have stomachs made of lead and the starting pistol's damage is seemingly on par with the damn Calibri if you aren't doming your opponents. Lowering the difficulty won't make bolts disappear or let enemies take 5 bolts to the dome without dying. The only thing it'll do is tank the player up, as enemies will do less damage and will be less likely to hit you. So there's no shame at all in playing a lower difficulty if that's how you want to go at the zone. But as long as you're hitting enemies in the head, you'll be just fine. But speaking of hitting enemies, you'll need some time to adjust how often your shots will be whiffing or seemingly doing nothing, even if your iron sights are dead on an enemy. Now it's Shooter Game 101 that aiming down your sights will make you more accurate, but Stalker didn't get its reputation by being conventional, and the iron sights are oftentimes worse than hip firing, as hip firing is just as accurate as aiming down sights. The gun model will take up a lot of screen space, and the already hard to see bullets will become even harder to see, so hip firing like it's a half-life game is a totally legitimate option. Despite this, I still aim down sights more often than not. Maybe it's force of habit, or years of Shooter Game brainwashing that iron sights make your gun a laser beam but I still did it all the time, knowing damn well my aim wouldn't be any better. Maybe I just like looking down shafts or something. Who knows. But regardless, unless you have a late game weapon that's in good condition, the weapon spread in this game is pretty gnarly. Later games in this series help alleviate this by having much more visible bullet tracers, so you can see exactly how your bullets are flying and make adjustments. But in Shadow of Chernobyl, the only way to tell where your bullets are going is if you see the bullet hit the ground or wall behind an enemy, if your enemy recoils or cries out some Russian jargon from the hit, or in the best case scenario, their body flops to the ground dead after a successful headshot, which feels incredibly satisfying to pull off, and stays satisfying throughout the entire game. As Master Difficulty makes even the brokest of bandits a lethal threat, so every kill feels earned and important. You will also be dying quite a lot, as no matter how well you think your plan of attack is, you'll eventually get into position, line up your shot perfectly, 
and with fuck. <laughs> but thanks to Stalker's saving system, you're in full control of your pace of play. If you want to only save at campfires and suffer like a real stalker, you can go right ahead and rest in peace to several hours of your life. Or if you want to just save before each encounter and attempt gunfights several times until you win, you can totally do that as well. Some may call that saves coming. I call it getting a discount on time. But the bottom line is, is that you're in full control of your pace of play. And that's one of the great things about this series. You can tailor your experience to be as brutal or forgiving as you want, and it doesn't compromise the experience whatsoever. And many mods really lean into this tailored experience mentality. And since you start off with such terrible weapons, I was extremely motivated to stack my rubles up to the ceiling to get better and more accurate weapons and more resilient armor, as progression in Stalker is made through money and equipment. Cause this shit is like real life. You can't add 10 points to your endurance on your birthday in real life, bitch. You can't even level up. But for now, we can't get better gear without doing some work. So once we smoke these bandits, and I let wolf shooters do most of the heavy lifting and loot the bodies afterwards. Thanks, fellas. Also, a quick side note. Another reason I installed ZRP was to fix a bug I ran into where I could see the enemy shadows through walls, giving me free built-in wall hacks. But we rescue Nimble, who the bandits were holding hostage, and we get the flash drive from him that he totally wasn't hiding up his... His ass. You know. And he also gives us the location of a stash that's marked by this purple Triforce looking icon. You'll be latently picking up stash locations as you play, as looting bodies will mark their stashes if they have one. Which I didn't realize until much later, so I was wondering where I was getting all these stash markers from for free. We return to Sidorovich's bunker and turn in the drive, and we get our next mission. Old Sid tells us that he has indeed heard of a stalker going by the name Strelok, and apparently this Strelok has found a way into the northern reaches of the zone, which we learn is currently inaccessible due to something called the Brain Scorcher which is seemingly a force field of psionic energy that, well, scorches the mind of any stalker who tries to go north towards Pripyat and beyond to the Chernobyl nuclear power plant, turning them into meandering slack-jawed zombies who are hostile to all stalkers. Sidorovich wants to learn how Strelok managed to get past the Brain Scorcher, and tasks us with fetching some research documents from the Agroprom Research Center that has information about the center of the zone. And once we have the research, we have to bring it to the barkeep at the 100 Rads bar north of the garbage, and we accept. I do a few side jobs to get my money up, which are very small bite-sized side quests. Go get X item, go here and kill Y, you know, the works. Anything for those sweet, sweet rubles. And once I feel ready, I head north to the garbage. Before I can get there, I gotta get past this makeshift military checkpoint, which is a good microcosm of the game's philosophy about combat in the open world. These army guys are way too strapped for you and will mow you down in seconds if you try to fight them. Trust me, I tried fighting these guys and got absolutely spanked, which forced me to cut and run around them while dodging the radiation zones and force anomalies around the train tracks. It really hammers home that the player has to pick and choose their battles, and sometimes just steering completely clear of a situation is your best option. And it just makes it all the more satisfying to come back later with better gear and get your lick back for all the time you wasted running around these guys. Once past the checkpoint, I get a phone call from Sidorovich, who tells me that a stalker named Fox may have some info about Strelok, and the text and voice acting are not on the same page at all. I find Fox injured, so hang tight bro, I'll go get you a medkit. And after 10 minutes of letting him bleed out in this destroyed shack, I return to heal him, who then immediately springs into battle with some mutant dogs nearby. And there's more audio mixing issues with these dogs. Their bark recordings seem to be peaking the microphone with how loud they are. I talked to Fox, who says that he had a brush with Strelok's group, and that his brother Seri would know more about Strelok. So I do a few more jobs and buy an AK-74U to see if I could take out the military checkpoint with it. The answer is no, I cannot, and I move on to the northernmost checkpoint out of the cordon and wipe out the bandits there to move on to the garbage. Stalker is a semi-open world game, being a collection of maps tied together through loading zones due to the game's technical limitations of the time. There is no fast travel system, so going from point A to point B can be a bit of a slog at times, especially when traveling across multiple maps and loading zones, but the maps are compact enough to the point where it never got too tedious. We can speed our travels along by sprinting by pressing X, with your stamina being tied to how much weight you're carrying, which at a base level is 50 kilos, which will fill up quicker than you think as ammo and medical supplies all have weight to them, making inventory management a big factor in battle and exploration preparation. You need to make sure you have enough weapons, the right types of ammo, and enough healing supplies to carry you through a quest. And it's very possible to overextend yourself and run out of healing supplies and ammo during an excursion, leaving you with your pants down and your snork exposed. But for now, once the checkpoint is cleared of the bandits, we head to the garbage. I spawn into the garbage with a bandit standing so close to me his gun barrel may as well be right between my ass cheeks. And there's two more bandits in the bushes to the left, 
and I'm wide open with no cover. I'm about to get jobbed so damn bad. This was one crusty ass fight. The bandits are hidden by the bushes and have x-ray vision right through them. And the bandits can walk past the loading zone and fire at you. And when I move to take them down, I cross into the loading zone and the prompt to travel pops up. So I decline it and the game spits me back out facing to the north and repositioned to the original spawn spot, which was extremely jarring at first and led to a few ass clappings from these bandits. But once I eventually outcrust these bandits, I get a message calling for aid and fighting off even more bandits. My favorite. I link up with the fighters and we ambush the bandits. We slaughter the bandits together. And it seems I fought so well, the fighters leader best sounds like he wants me. And you, stalker. Come over here. Let's have a chat. Best gives me two bands of rubles for my help, and I move on to link up with Seri, who is dealing with bandits attacking his position at the garbage warehouse. I run into some radioactive junk piles along the way, radiation being pretty straightforward in this game. If you're in a radioactive area, your gyro counter will start clicking and you'll build up radiation contamination, which will start draining your health if you're exposed for too long. And like bleeding, it's on a color scale of severity, and you can reduce radiation by taking radiation drugs or pounding back some Cossacks vodka. Huh, nice reference. I also start finding a few artifacts, which can be found near anomalies and can be spotted by small visual cues like small fire trails and pulsating spots, as artifacts will be invisible until you're up close to one. Artifacts add a layer of RPG-like elements to Stalker, as you can equip up to 5 artifacts that can modify your stats, such as improving damage type resistance, health regeneration, and so on. And it usually comes with a trade-off in the form of a debuff to another resistance or regeneration, or it may simply slowly poison you with radiation. Also. The game is trolling you with artifacts that modify health. When an artifact says it modifies health, what it really modifies is health regeneration. So I spent most of this game thinking I had a 400% extra health boost, completely oblivious to the fact that I was just making myself slightly weaker all around. But since I still made it through the game regardless, I'll forgive the devs for this misdirection. Artifact hunting will be expanded on mechanically in clear sky, and in Shadow of Chernobyl it's pretty straightforward. See rock, grab it, you're golden. I reach the garbage warehouse and kill off the attacking bandits and speak to Seri. Seri says that a stalker named Mole has learned that Stellox Straffs is somewhere underneath Agriprom, and he points me to their meeting point. So I head right on over to Agriprom. Once there, I soon find Mole and his guys in a shootout with the military, and I join in on the fight, and I'm able to snag myself a sweet new AK-47 off some military guys. And so far this game has been ramping up firefights at a great pace. This fight with the army is tough, but incredibly satisfying to overcome, and rewards you with better weapons and ammo for your efforts. Once the army goons are wiped out, we can speak to Mole, who tries his best to sync his mouth movements to his voice, and mostly failing. The grunts always carry their missions through. We have got to get out of here before the task force arrives. Come on. He leads us to the entrance of the Agripom underground where we can find Strelok's stash, and we hop down into the sewers. Stalker's lighting system really gets the flex down here in the sewers, and it's honestly impressive that this is a game from 2007. The rotating underground lights and enemy headlamps look great and pretty damn realistic. Speaking of fighting in the dark, my dumbass didn't know that I also had a light source I could turn on using L, so I got clipped a few times trying to fight sewer bandits in the dark, but I soon figured out how to turn on my flashlight. I fight through the sewers, kill a bloodsucker mutant, the mutants in this game really add to the horror elements of the zone. The invisible bloodsuckers must have had gamers shitting their pants in 2007. The strategy to take mutants down is the same as any other thing that moves in Stalker, just aim for the head. Because mutants can take some serious punishment when hit below the neck. This bloodsucker here took more than a clip of 762 right to the sternum. Once past the bloodsucker, you can then take on some army goons patrolling the sewers. And I- yeah. Excuse me. I then climb through a pipe to find Strelok's old hideout, and behind a map board we can find Strelok's comically large flash drive. From the drive we learn that one of Strelok's men, Fang, had been killed after Strelok had gone to the center of the zone alone. It mentions that another one of Strelok's men, Ghost, would know where to find Strelok. So now our next task is to find out where Ghost is, or what happened to him, and we move to leave the underground. We fight more military guys on the way out, and right before we leave, we get jump scared by a controller mutant. A controller is a special psychic mutant that can blast our brains so hard that we die from it. Your screen will start getting shaky and blurry and a high pitched frequency will ring out in your character's head. And if the controller has a line of sight on you, he will pull the camera to himself and psychic blast a third of your health off. And since he's all the way down at the other end of the hall, I just booked it out of the sewers and ran away from this freak for now. But don't worry, I'm still getting my lick back. I exit the underground right into the military base at Agriprom Research Institute, and since I need to grab the documents here, and stealth is not exactly working out for me. This game does indeed have a stealth system, but I can never manage to get too far without getting spotted. And the alarm always eventually got sounded. So I see no other option than to shoot my way through the base and grab the research. It's the toughest fight yet, and this place is crawling with army goons. 
but I slowly take these army guys down after several deaths and some expertly placed saves. And I reach the third floor of the Institute and grab the documents and fight my way out of Agropron after some more trial and error combat and make my way back to the garbage and head north to the bar. The path to the bar is blocked by some duty soldiers, one of the major factions in the zone. I tell them I have business with the barkeep and they let me pass. Now is probably a good time to talk about the factions of Stalker, as the deeper you get into the zone, you'll start encountering more organized factions, who all exist as responses to the zone itself. We just met some guys from Duty, a militaristic faction that sees the zone as a threat to all of humanity that must be contained, so they spend most of their time killing mutants, bandits, and patrolling the zone, acting as a sort of police force of the zone. And when they're not doing that, they're usually fighting with their dreaded ops, the Freedom Faction. Freedom is a sort of opposite to duty, as they believe that the zone is a boon for humankind, that gives humanity the potential to make massive scientific leaps and live the truly free lives they want. Some other factions are the Free Stalkers, who are technically not a faction, but the high number of independent and small squads of self-interested stalkers within the zone makes them almost on par with an organized faction like duty in terms of numbers. There are also the Ecologists, scientists who want to study and research the zone for obvious reasons, who employ stalkers and mercenaries to do their legwork for them, as the scientists themselves are not fighters. There are also the Mercenaries, external paramilitary groups sent into the zone on behalf of their employers, but they're a pretty loose faction, and in Shadow of Chernobyl they mostly exist as hired thugs the marked one can shoot in the head. There are other factions like the Bandits and the Military, who are pretty straightforward. Bandits are just evil stalkers who will rob and kill anyone for cash and artifacts. And the Military, well it's in the name. And they are also hostile to all stalkers, as it's still technically illegal to enter the zone. Although the military is failing absolutely miserably at that. The stalkers literally have a full settlement complete with a bar and combat arena within the zone. The last major faction in the game is Monolith, but I'll talk about them a bit later. These factions really add a lot to the world building of Stalker, as all the non-hostile factions are built on reasonable responses to the zone, and how humanity should treat it. Unless the players ask themselves what they think of the zone, and they can decide to work for the faction they agree with the most. The factions aren't super deep or anything, hell you can't even join them in Shadow of Chernobyl, but their presence makes the zone feel more alive and dynamic, and also, they got some pretty cool ass patches. We enter Rostock, get past these bastard dogs, get out of here, stop. yo he said the line, and head on over to the 100 Rads bar. I love the bar area, the vibes of this place are immaculate. When you first enter, you're greeted by the doorman, who without fail will always say, I said come in, don't stand there. His firm but inviting voice reassuring you that you're in a safe and secure place. You then enter the bar, which has some really sweet, albeit a bit compressed music playing, and you meet the barkeep face to face, and his model is just, it's just immaculate. I've never seen a character model look so Eastern European. The hairline, the face, the tattoos, the build, it's perfect. I turn the documents over to the barkeep, and he gives us half a rack of rubles for our work. I speak to the barkeep again, and he tells me that the military documents reference an X-18 lab in the Dark Valley, and the lab requires two keys to enter. He gives us one of the keys, and tells us that some other guy named Borov in the Dark Valley has the other key. The barkeep also recommends that we get a protective suit to enter the Dark Valley, as the radiation levels there are much more dangerous. This tripped me up though, because I thought this meant the entire Dark Valley area was irradiated, and when you approach the Dark Valley, your Geiger counter starts going apeshit. So I thought, whoa, okay, I guess I need some sort of hazard suit then? So I spent extra time doing side quests looking for a hazard suit plug with little success, only to later realize that the radiation isn't as scary as I thought, and you don't actually need to have a ton of protection to go through the Dark Valley, as you're just supposed to run through the radioactive barrier and take some rats to the face before entering the Dark Valley, and once you're in the valley, you're good. I feel like the game could have communicated this better, maybe having the barkeep recommend stocking up on radiation meds as an alternative to getting a protective suit. But it's also not that big of a deal, and I was confused mostly due to my inexperience with the game. In the Dark Valley, I link up with this duty soldier who asked me to help him free his comrade from a bandit camp. I agree to rescue the dutier. Dutier? Really? Well, whatever. We take a short stroll and free the dutier from his bandit captors after a quick fight. We speak to our dutier in distress and he tells us that there's a second dutier being held hostage back in the bandit's base, and that the bandit's boss Barav has the key to the X-18 lab. I get mauled to death by a horde of mike peeking dogs, and while we're looking for the entrance to the bandit base, I run into this genuinely scary moment where I find a room full of bodies, and then get ambushed by an invisible bloodsucker from behind. <laughs> nice little moment. I then reach and fight through the bandit base, which is a pretty tough close quarters battle, and screw these shotgun bandits. I eventually make it to Borov's office and spray him down, and I find the basement and free the second dutier. I don't recall grabbing a key from Borov's body, I guess it just gets added to our inventory once we kill him? And I make my way over to the lab marker, 
kill a few more bandits, and enter the secret X-18 lab. These labs are some of my favorite parts of the game, and it's in my opinion where Stalker is at its tensest and scariest, while also giving us fascinating pieces of lore as we try to figure out what the hell is being researched down here. The lab is full of anomalies and mutants, including the Snorks. Mutated humans who walk around on all fours, roar like a damn lion, and get the name Snork from the dangling tube on the gas mask they have strapped to their heads. The Snorks are definitely the most unsettling mutant to me. They're the most animalistic human type mutants and their skin is all ripped and torn to shreds. Looks pretty painful. And they can also be a real pain in the ass to deal with at times, as they run around really quick like a wild dog, hit real hard, and unless you're hitting your headshots, can take more than a few bullets to the gut. And trying to pull off headshots while spraying out a fast moving enemy at Stalker is way easier said than done. Snorks aside, our goal here is to get a code that unlocks a door in the main room, which we can find on the body of a scientist behind some Snorks and Flame Anomalies. And you bet your ass I got Chris more than a few times. But I get the code from the body, 1243, and enter the next level of the lab, which has another code lock door. So I do more anomaly dodging and fight a pseudo giant mutant who can do some massive fleet slams for some huge shockwave damage, but the bastard goes down after about two AK clips to the face. So it's not too bad of a fight. But later games in this series buff this mutant into the fucking stratosphere, so just wait. But past the mutant, we can find another body in code, and we punch that into the second door. And once inside, we arrive at the central laboratory, which is full of these weird yellow limbless babies in pods. But there's no time to gawk at these fucked up mustard children, as the door closes behind us and shit starts getting anomalous. I thought this was just another fire anomaly, but it's actually an invisible mutant, the Poltergeist, or as I like to call him, the Meat Ghost, who is this glowing orange aura that floats around the room spawning flame spewing anomalies. I actually had to look up how to progress here because I was sure it was just another anomaly, and I was completely oblivious to the Meat Ghost's presence but I eventually figure it out and blast the ghost until it explodes into a meat shower, and I grab the documents. Soon after, we see another cutscene, which shows visions of a hooded man in the Chernobyl nuclear power plant, and then a massive horde of rats starts running out of the grass, and the hooded man starts spraying his AK into the rats. He then turns his head after hearing the name Strelok, and his face is completely obscured, and the vision ends. We then snap back to reality and hear chatter from Spetsnaz operatives who have entered the lab, so it looks like we'll be fighting our way out of here. And it's a pretty tough fight. These army guys are well equipped, but I slog it out after some tough gunfights and I take an extended detour back to the cordon, as the military has blocked off the entrance I came in through. I finally get my lick back against those army checkpoint dickheads with my better weapons. And this felt great. Look, this guy can't even believe it. I then turn around and head back to Rostock to turn in the documents to the barkeep, and I get a rack of rubles from my hard work. Nice. He mulls them over and we learn that the Brain Scorcher is indeed a man-made wave emitter, and that the labs were manufacturing the components for it. We also learn of another lab, the X-16 lab, in the Lake Yantar area, where some ecologist scientists are currently shacked up. To get to Yantar, we have to fight through a western part of Rostock, which is currently crawling with some hostile mercs who are attacking a downed ecologist helicopter, trying to get their research. The head scientist asks us for help, and since we're such a class act, we slaughter these merc goons in some old-fashioned urban warfare. And once they're dead, I speak to Professor Kruglov, who asks us to help him escort him back to Yantar. Once we recruit him, more mercs move in to attack us, so it's time for some more shooting. I even accidentally killed the professor after mistaking him for an enemy at a distance. I guess the mark one needs some glasses. Eventually, I lead him to an underpass that's infested with anomalies and a few zombies, and we gotta sneak through it to reach Yantar. To proceed through, the game's intention is for you to throw metal bolts to detect the anomalies, but I fail to realize that you can even equip the bolts, as you cannot mouse wheel through them by default. So my punishment for this gamer ignorance is getting my ass seared like a Christmas ham a few times. But I eventually make it through by looking real carefully at the air distortions and sticking close to the middle of the underpass, and we head to Yantar. Once at Yantar, we reach the scientist's base, which is under fire from some zombified shooters. That's right, Slavic zombies can still use guns. We take the zombies down and enter the lab, and we can speak to the professor, Sakharov. We ask the professor about the X-16 lab, and he says he does know about the lab, but the lab is in Brain Scorcher Central, and it's impossible to reach without psionic protection, and it's also infested with zombified stalkers. Damn. But luckily for us, the scientists are working on a psi protector headset that will allow us to access the lab. We just need to help them get a few more measurements to complete it. So we link back up with our boy Kruglov and get those measurements. We check out a pipe, fight through some zombies, and inspect another area. But as we're working, a zone blowout starts, and we have to take cover. A blowout is a massive release of energy from the center of the zone that causes anomalies and artifacts to shift and move around the zone. A cutscene plays, and the game is really showing its age in this cutscene. Just watch it. We can't just leave him like that. 
Just leave him. There is nothing we can do for him. The blowout is minutes away and we won't get through with him. No, Fang. I'm not leaving him. We wake up in the bus that we were inspecting to the sound of moaning and groaning, which I soon find is Kruglov injured on the ground after the emission. I heal up my guy and we return to the bunker together. Also, whenever I have a companion with me, I constantly hear the heavy breathing sound effect. Maybe the marked one has some nasty social anxiety. We return to the lab with the measurements and speak to Sakharov. And once I get around Kruglov's hitbox, for some reason the human hitboxes in this game are much larger than the actual models, and you can get pushed around by them a little bit. It's a little awkward. We get the prototype psionic protector in the location of the lab. To find the entrance, Sakharov mentions that one of his underlings and Ghost, one of Strelok's men, had tried to find the lab entrance, but seemingly died trying to find it. So we gotta find out what happened to them. The scientist's body is only a short stroll away from the lab, guarded by some swamp zombies. I take the zombies down and check the corpse, which has a recording of them accessing the lab's entrance, which is located underneath the compound to the north. I clear out the zombies and snorks loitering around outside, and enter the lab. This lab is more of a straightforward shooting gallery, having us take down more mutants and zombies to progress in these large open rooms. We do this until we reach a central control room, where we have to disable the massive unknown device in the center on a 4 minute countdown, which is the amount of time we've got until our psi protection goes down, and we're zombified by the brain scorcher blasting 500,000 hours of skibbity toilet rain to our amygdala. This part is pretty tough. There are enemies all around and above you, and the control room is filled with dangerous anomalies but I power through and reach the final control module and turn it off, and we see that the central device is being powered by a massive brain in a jar. Huh, I wonder what the hell that's about. But once the final module is off, we pass out again and get another cutscene, showing an unnamed man asking someone about a picture of the sarcophagus at the CNPP, which then cuts to a man showing a mystical looking artifact, and we learn that this guy is Strelok himself, and then cuts to a heavily injured Strelok collapsing and then being healed by the man. Once he's healed, Strelok says he will head north and walks off, leaving the man alone in the swamp with his dog. We then wake back up in the lab, and as I leave, I'm attacked by another controller. But this time, I'm getting my lick back, so I get as close as I can to the mutant without getting in his line of sight, and spray into his face to take him down. And in the same room, we can find Ghost's corpse, where we can get the lab documents in his sweet sunrise suit, and leave the lab through some underground pipes. I was dangerously low on ammo and the pipes had a few snorks and zombie stragglers down below, so I had to get pretty lucky with my shots, and I eventually make it through. Once back out on the surface, I take a hike through Agriprom and back through the garbage back to Rostock, and link back up with the barkeep. With the new info from the X-16 lab, we now have the location of the Brain Scorcher, and now it's time to go and shut that shit down. To do that, we need to go north through the military warehouses and go to the Red Forest, where the Brain Scorcher is located, so I load up on ammo and head out. I reach the border to the Black Forest, which comes under attack from Monolith. Okay, now we can talk about Monolith. But first, some background. A common rumor amongst the stalkers of the zone is that at the center of the zone, there exists something called the Wish Grainer, a mysterious monolith of unknown origin that is said to have the ability to grant the deepest wish of anyone who finds it. But, thanks to the Brain Scorcher, the center of the zone is inaccessible to anyone with a working brain. That is, except for those in the Monolith faction. Monolith are a mysterious, yet heavily armed faction that seem to worship the Wish Grainer and are fanatically devoted to it, killing anyone they see who isn't a part of their faction and communicating with the Monolith by entering a geek session where they kneel down and sway their heads around while chanting. Monoliths serve as the endgame opposition in the Stalker series, as they are equipped with the best weapons and gear, and they hold Pripyat and the power plant under their control. Once we talk to the border guard here, the Monolith forces attack the outpost, and we join in on the fight. There's a ton of these monolithian goons, but we also have a lot of backup from these freedom border guards. So I flank around the bushes and rocks and take a few of them down. And once they're down, we can take some sweet weapons like the VLA special assault rifle and ammo off their bodies. This gun is awesome to use, and it's when I really started feeling like a powerful stalker. I really like the types of guns that you can acquire in this game, as it has a lot of weapons you don't see too often in other shooters like this VLA, the IL-89, the Tunder, or is it the Tunder, S14, and later the F-2000, which is a gun I don't think I've seen in a video game since Modern Warfare 2 all the way back in 2009. And also notice this fork and spoon icon? That's right, Stalker has a hunger system too. But since slain enemies drop food items pretty often, which are the Slavic diet staples, canned fish, kielbasa, and bread. But I was picking up and eating food often enough that this system was a non-issue for me. 
Once the attacking monolith squad is wiped out, we can speak to the guard again, who gives us some money for our help. The path to the Brain Scorcher is now open, but monolith forces have it heavily defended. Plus, there's something else we need to do. After we found Ghost's corpse, we then get a new task to find and speak with yet another one of Strelok's men, Guide, back at the cordon. I reach Guide and ask him where I can find Doctor, the man we see healing Strelok in the cutscenes. Guide tells us that the Doc is back at Strelok's hideout in the Agriprom underground, so we head right on over, retracing my steps from last time. But before I enter Strelok's base, I get flashbanged and I wake up to Doctor lording over me. Doctor then drops a plot nuke on us by calling us Strelok. Yup, we were Strelok the entire time. And we learn that our last excursion into the center of the zone failed, which led us to lose our memory and got us into our current situation. Doctor also tells us that the Wish Grainer is indeed real, but it's an illusion created by a lab that's next to the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. To find this lab, Doctor tells us that he has a decoder to access the lab being stashed in an apartment at Pripyat. He then vanishes from sight in the game. This cutscene is a tough scene in terms of audio mixing. When I was playing it, I could barely hear what Doctor was saying over this loud, disembodied, droning, groaning noise. Just listen. Got no time, so I need you to listen to me. Everything you have said about the monolith is true. All of it. It is just in it manufactured in a lab next to the sarcophagus. But regardless, with this info in hand, it's clear what's next. It's time to go turn off the Brain Scorcher. I return to the Red Force and fight my way to the control center. The combat is really ramping up into the endgame here, but I'm strapped for the occasion. And the combat is really clicking for me now, and my weapons are now pretty reliably accurate, and it's a blast to just headshot these goons. I make it to the Brain Scorcher array, fighting off mindless shooters and mutant hallucinations until I get underground, and shoot up even more mutants. Nothing too crazy. And I reach the central Brain Scorcher control console and shut that shit down for good. Once it's off, Strelok does his famous pass out after clearing an underground area shtick, and in another cutscene we see the Wish Grainer itself in the sarcophagus, and we see Strelok desperately reaching out for it before passing out. Once we wake up, we now get the objective to reach the sarcophagus, and with the Scorcher down, it's finally time to make a run at it. We fight our way out of the facility, Monolith invading the place like the Spetsnaz did earlier in X-18, and I shoot my way out of the facility. Once I'm back topside, I get a phone call from the barkeep, who tells us that with the Brain Scorcher down, everyone in the zone is making a dash for the center and all the treasures it may contain, and he tells us to link up with a squad of duty men who can help us battle through Pripyat. It's really cool to visit the famous ghost city of Pripyat in this game but the area is mostly a late game combat gauntlet. I consider Pripyat to be the start of the Stalker Endgame, as it's where the enemies are the strongest and the best equipped. We fight through the streets of Pripyat, shooting down monolith snipers and thugs in a pretty difficult urban battle. But I really like these urban fights, and this game is still managing to strike a fair balance between that brutal tactical gunplay while still empowering the player to kill several enemies, when it easily could have devolved into an unfair clusterfuck, which unfortunately does start to happen a bit later. But for now, I reach the hotel and have a sniper battle with these monolith goons and reach the stash with a decoder and pick up some nice armor. With the decoder in hand, we have everything we need to make a move on the power plant. I come across this large field of anomalies that's guarded with some monolith troops armed with RPGs, so I flank around the field to take them down and get blown to smithereens a few times before killing them off. I then move on to Chernobyl itself, and this is by far the crustiest stretch of the game. Not only do you have to kill several more monolith fighters, you now also have to deal with the military raining violent death on you from their helicopters. Now I wasn't sure if those RPG enemies were there so you could take their weapons and destroy the choppers with the RPGs, but I highly doubted that would even work, and if it did, I'd still be getting atomized by these helicopters while I'm trying to line up my shots. So I just said screw it and ran as fast as I could, hoping the helicopters wouldn't get me, which eventually succeeded after a couple attempts and expertly placed saves. It's just an absolute wash of getting mowed down from above and sprinting from cover to cover in a frenzy. And there's even a time limit you gotta beat before it insta-kills you, making you clench your ass that much more. But despite all these obstacles, I make it into the power plant regardless. The inside of the CMPP is probably my favorite part of the entire game. There's just something so naturally unsettling about being inside of the CMPP, and it's got some really powerful atmosphere. Literally, it's irradiated as hell, and your Geiger counter will be going ham for the entire time you're inside. But I was able to counter this by using some anti-radiation artifacts, which made me feel pretty clever. As you progress, a disembodied voice will beckon you towards the Wish Grainer, but I can't understand what this voice is saying in Russian, but I bet whatever he's saying, it's probably pretty convincing. Иди ко мне. 
This is the final combat gauntlet of the entire game, having you fight exoskeleton armored goons who are equipped with only the best endgame weapons, like Gauss rifles and F-2000s. But that also means you get to pick those weapons up, so it evens out. I fight through the monolith forces and eventually get inside the sarcophagus, which is even more unsettling to be in, as you can still see the destruction from the original 1986 power plant meltdown, which I thought was really, really cool. I really liked being in here. We can also see the Wish Granner itself, a glowing blue monolith on a raised platform, lording over the silence of the sarcophagus. I enter a portal in front of it, and I do a short tour of this massive cancer hole, and I approach the monolith. Upon interacting with it, my Strelok wishes for the zone to disappear. Strelok's wish will be different based on how you played the game, and it will change based on how much money you have, your reputation, who you killed and let live, and so on. And after making his wish, we see a cutscene of Strelok in a sunny field, who opens his eyes to reveal that he has no pupils. He wished for the zone to disappear, so the wish grainer blinded him. <laughs> Fucking got him. <laughs> but wait, that can't be right. I'm forgetting something. Oh yeah, the decoder. To get the true ending, we need to find the door to the monolith control center within the power plant. So I reload my save and go through the monolith meat grinder again, and this time I find the secret door. I fight off the monolith shooters as the decoder works as magic, and I enter the secret monolith control center. Inside is more monolith death gauntlets to shoot through. This room with the barred doors is especially difficult, as the monolith fighters have many angles to attack you from, and plenty of cover. It's a tough but very engaging fight, and I think these close quarters engagements really complement Stalker's combat the best. And I eventually reach this room with a hologram of the Wish Grainer surrounded by some electric pylons. And I got confused for a hot minute on what to do here, as there are no obvious switches to interact with, and the pylons don't seem to get destroyed by bullets. And wait, oh, hold on, hold on. The door isn't closed. One sec. Okay, there we go. Okay, so it turns out the pylons do break, but it'll take more than one bullet to break them. And I wasn't too keen on wasting my ammo unloading a clip into a pylon that may or may not break. But once I break all the pylons and kill the meat ghosts who try to stop me, a hologram of a man appears in the center of the room. And from him, we can learn the truth about the creation of the zone. It turns out that the zone was created as a result of a botched experiment to manipulate something called the Noosphere. The new sphere? No, son, the Noosphere. The Noosphere is a real world theory and it's pretty high concept. But in short, much like how the Earth developed an atmosphere as it was developing as a planet, the Noosphere formed as humanity developed. The Noosphere being a sort of intangible field of information surrounding the planet that any living thing with cognition is connected to. Essentially a second atmosphere of psychic energy. Yeah, I bet you didn't expect Stalker to turn into a persona plot. <laughs> but anyway, seven of these scientists link their minds together to form the common, or most commonly known as the C consciousness. A super consciousness that they hoped that they could use to interface with the Noosphere and modify it. And these scientists wanted to remove human vices such as greed, cruelty, and other negative forces from the Noosphere, and by extension, human cognition. Ignition. But the scientists got too big for their britches and fucked the experiment up, which created the zone, which is a manifestation of an unnatural crack in the noosphere, which explains the impossible physics and phenomena that happens within it. The seed consciousness says that they are attempting to fix their mistake and contain the zone, and that humanity is not ready to learn the truth of the zone in the noosphere. So to keep the truth of the zone a secret, they created the wish grainer as a distraction that would capture any stalkers who got too close to the truth, and they'd be recruited into the monolith forces essentially making them slave soldiers to the sea consciousness. And these are the same guys who built the Brain Scorcher, which was built to keep the stalkers out and to zombify those who tried to enter. Strelok had fallen victim to them on his last excursion into the center of the zone, and was recruited, branded, and mistakenly given the task to kill himself, which of course failed, as Strelok still had his free will. Once we learn this truth, we can decide to join the sea consciousness or reject them. I decided to reject them, as they seemed pretty incompetent and unable to fix the damage they did to the Noosphere. I mean, their whole operation got exposed because they gave one guy the wrong directive. So I say no, and I'm instantly teleported to a dark hallway and make my way back outside. And it's time for one last fight. We have to walk around the outside of the power plant and enter these teleporters in sequence to progress. It's another very tough fight. Monolith troops are throwing all they got at you, and they can teleport in around you, and they have some pretty tough range positions you have to flush out. But just keep moving from teleporter to teleporter, I think you have to pass through like 15 or so of them. And you even get teleported back to Sidorovich's bunker. He almost shits his pants at the sight of us manifesting out of thin air in his bunker. <laughs> it's a great little moment. Mark one, what the hell? And once we enter the last teleporter, we get a cutscene of Strelok finding the pods where the sea consciousness are jacked into. Hoping to get rid of the zone for good, he cocks his AK, gives the camera a concerned look, and opens fire on the pods. Strelok then wakes up in a sunny field and contemplates if that was the right thing to do. 
and lays down in the grass to take a much needed nappy poo. And once that cutscene is done, that's the story of Shadow of Chernobyl complete. There's now a free roam option to keep the fun times in the zone rolling, but for us, that's where I'll leave it. Overall, Shadow of Chernobyl is a fantastic experience. Its world, atmosphere, and gameplay are all incredibly unique and still hold up incredibly well to this day. And the story itself, although a bit fast and loose at times, still manages to be incredibly intriguing and compelling. And the zone and its lore will stick with you long after you're done playing. Sure, the game definitely shows its age at times and it's full of that patented Eastern European jank, but this game has a huge modding community to address these bigger issues, as the underlying experience this game provides is well worth its rough patches. I'd recommend this game to anyone, any day of the week. But that's just the first game. Now it's time to take a look at our second Stalker game, Stalker Clear Sky. Clear Sky is a bit of a unique beast. Clear Sky? Well, not really. The middle child of the Stalker series dropped only about a year and a half after Shadow of Chernobyl. Clear Sky is a prequel to Shadow of Chernobyl, featuring new areas, characters, and some much needed engine updates and fixes. But it still remains as the franchise's black sheep of sorts. Does Clear Sky clear Shadow of Chernobyl? Well, you're about to find out. Like its older brother, Clear Sky opens with a cutscene. We see a group of scientists being led by a stalker. That stalker is us, Scar the Mercenary, or Mercenary Scar as most NPCs refer to him as. The head scientist nervously talks about the next time they expect an emission from the zone to occur, saying the next emission should occur within two months. He doesn't know. An emission then hits not long after, and we wake up in a base, being watched over by two men. They're shocked that Scar had survived the emission, his body seemingly having a natural resistance to the emission's energy, only suffering some nerve damage, but totally fine besides that. I don't know though. Bro looks a little hollowed on that bed. Oh. We wake up and we are greeted by Lebedev, the leader of the faction that saved us, Clear Sky. Hey, that's the name of the game. Lebedev says that his men found Scar unconscious in the swamps, having miraculously survived the emission and barely missed getting devoured by a pack of pseudodog mutants. Lebedev then forgets that he left the stove on and leaves us to meet with the rest of the Clear Sky crew and finish our conversation later. We talk to Clear Sky scientist, Professor Beanpolev. <laughs> Beanpolev? Ah yes, I think I've heard about his brother, Dr. Poindexterchev. By talking to Beanpolev, we can learn more about Clear Sky's goals. They're essentially a more militarized version of the ecologists, as they're trying to study and understand the zone, but aren't afraid to pull out the blammer when trouble arises. And they want to keep themselves hidden and separated from the internal zone conflicts, so they can continue their research. So to hide themselves, they establish their HQ in a hidden area of the swamps, a new map in the zone. As we continue talking to Beanpolev, he reveals that he knows that the zone is man-made, but cannot be destroyed as far as we know, and Clear Sky wants to promote a coexistence between humanity and the zone. This is very interesting, as the only people who know that the zone is man-made are the sea consciousness themselves, Doctor, and Strelok at the end of Shadow of Chernobyl. This heavily implies that the Clear Sky leadership are closely tied to the original group that later became the sea consciousness, but unfortunately, the game doesn't really elaborate on this through the dialogue, mostly just heavily implying close ties between Clear Sky and the Sea Consciousness through what the characters allude to knowing. Which is a bit disappointing for me, as we don't learn anything new about the zone from the Clear Sky leaders, which makes the game feel a little narratively stagnant. Even a bit more lore exposition on what that group was doing before they had their schism and turned into a psychic ghost would have gone a long way. But that's just the lore fiend in me yelling for more. We continue talking to Beanpolev, just love this dude's name, about the unusual uptick in the zone's emissions, and he theorizes that these emissions are the zone's response to some sort of human meddling, and if it isn't stopped, a worse incident than the original 1986 meltdown may occur. We then talk to the bartender Cold and get some more background on Clear Sky's current situation. We then talk to Lebedev again, who elaborates more on what Clear Sky wants to do with the zone, that being to understand and learn to live alongside the zone as they also see it as a scientific boon to the world. We also learn that the emission we got blasted with was unusually powerful, and has caused the zone and its anomalies to shift, opening up new areas of the zone and closing off others, explaining this game's new map layout. Scar isn't sure what to do next, but Lebedev kinda has us by the balls here, as he saved our life and letting us leave may result in us leaking Clear Sky's existence to the rest of the zone, but we're interrupted by a distress call from some Clear Sky guys out in the swamps. So we agree to help and Lebedev sends us to the camp's trader to get us equipped for the mission. Stalker camps have gotten a much needed overhaul, with each camp now having a trader, a new trader called the technician, who can upgrade and repair weapons for a fee, these upgrades being more integral to the game's progression than you'd think, as many weapons are piss poor accuracy wise without them. There's also the guide, and important characters, and they're all clearly marked on the updated in-game map, which also has been greatly improved in its UI and interactions. 
Quests are now tied to factions, and rewards can be picked up at the camp's trader, which saves a lot of time when turning in rewards and getting supplies. As in Shadow of Chernobyl, there are only a handful of traders that traded weapons and gear that you would have to seek out, such as traveling all the way back to Rostock when you wanted to trade with the barkeep. But now, each map area will have an easily accessible trader that handles all that, plus quest rewards in one convenient place. We get our starter gear from Suslov, and speak to the guy to travel to the swamps. The stalker guides are Clear Sky's fast travel system, and by talking to them you can travel to camps and places you've captured from your ops. It's a great addition that cuts some fat from the game by eliminating some stretches of boring backtracking, and it's integrated into the game in a pretty seamless way that makes complete sense within universe. We go with the guide and we get our first real minutes of gameplay. The game has gotten a small but noticeable graphical upgrade, which I'll talk more about later, and we get a tutorial on the expanded artifact mechanics. In Shadow of Chernobyl, Finding artifacts was pretty basic. If you saw a little pulsating spot, approach it, the artifact will appear, and you pick it up. Simple as. But in Clear Sky, finding artifacts is a much more involved process. First off, you now need a detector to find artifacts, as even if you're near one, it won't appear unless you have your detector equipped. And these detectors have tiers. The first one you get will just beep the closer you are to an artifact, and it's the worst one. The mid-level detector will show you the direction the artifact is in on a radar, and the best detector will show you the exact location of the artifact on the radar. But at least in my playthrough, artifact hunting was a surprisingly rare occurrence in this game, which I'll talk more about in a bit. But for now, I use my detector to get the artifact once I figure out how to actually whip the detector out, which you can do by pressing O when not holding your primary weapon which is a bit annoying to have to cycle through your inventory to equip a pistol or a bolt so you then can pull out your detector. But Call of Pripyat fixes this fortunately. But regardless, I head to the outpost, which is under attack from some hog mutants, and I climb the ladder and join the fight with the other Clear Sky member here. But our hog hunting session is cut short when another mission from the zone hits, killing our Clear Sky buddy dead as a doornail and knocking us out again. We wake back up in our Clear Sky base bed again, and we have another chat with Lebedev, who says that since we've survived two emissions, he's certain that we have an unusual affinity to the zone. But there's a fly in the ointment, he says. Is this an actual phrase? I've literally never heard that until I played this game. And he tells us that the emissions are still damaging our nervous system, which could end up killing us if we keep taking more emission blasts to the face. Lebedev believes that someone has somehow gotten past the brain scorcher, which is causing the zone to violently react. And we know that this is Strelok and his gang, but they don't. And Lebedev reveals to us that he used to work at Chernobyl before the meltdown, which ties him even closer to the Sea Consciousness group, and he even flat out says that he knows more about the zone than he's telling you, but he can't share all his knowledge with us, and we'll just have to take his word on some things. Which is fine for now, narratively. I mean, why would he trust some random bushwhack mercenary with the deepest secrets of the zone? But he still doesn't elaborate on this later at all, so it's a bit disappointing. But regardless, that's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about our next move, and Clear Sky wants these emissions to stop yesterday. So we need to find Strelok and get him to cut it out. One problem with that though, Clear Sky aren't exactly the most capable faction right now, and they can't even fight off the lonely bandits who have moved into their swamps. But without Clear Sky's help and knowledge of the zone, Scar will likely die from emission-induced nerve damage real soon. So Scar and Lebedev decided to team up and stop these emissions, hopefully saving our merc ass in the process. Our first step in figuring out the source of these emissions is to head on over to the cordon to see our old pal Sidorovich and ask after a stalker who was recently shopping for some strange technical components. But the path to the cordon is blocked, as the swamps are currently overrun with renegade bandits. So we first have to help clear Sky recapture key positions in the swamps. We agree to help and head on out, and get a quick overview of our updated PDA, which has been made bigger and easier to use. Sweet. We also get introduced to the new Faction Wars system. Faction Wars are a big part of Clear Sky, and it's the main focus outside of the game's story. Each area now has several key locations in them that a faction can take control of. And you, the player, can directly contribute to the Faction Wars by joining with a faction and capturing positions for them. The more positions you capture, the stronger your faction's presence will be, and you'll have better access to gear and resources. In the swamps here, it's Clear Sky versus the Renegades, a new faction who are by all intents and purposes just THE Bandit Faction with an alternate name and they may as well just be called the Swamp Bandits. This was done because players can actually join the bandits later in the game if they choose to, and it would be a bit awkward to join them after you spent the first few hours of gameplay exterminating them in the swamps. It's a pretty ambitious feature for the Stalker series, and it makes each area of the zone feel much more dynamic and dangerous, as the number of enemies you'll be fighting has increased considerably. The dots on the map aren't just a single enemy, those are squads with up to five enemies. So you'll be wiping out these guys to take out positions, and then wiping out even more squads who come to counterattack you, as enemy factions react to your actions, usually by sending a squad or two to try to retake the position you just captured, which they easily can do if they manage to overwhelm you. It's a pretty cool system that makes the zone feel much more alive and reactive, but due to its complexity, that also means it comes with some pretty serious bugs. 
I even had to start a new game because I essentially got softlocked in the swamps, as I killed all the enemies at a key location, but my clear sky allies bugged out and refused to move to secure the position in order to complete the quest. And they seemingly got stuck at this church, aiming their guns at the wall and at nothing at all. These bugs are unfortunately a bit of a trend in clear sky, as although clear sky is much more stable than Shadow of Chernobyl, and it only crashed on me maybe once or twice, there are way more gameplay bugs than in Shadow of Chernobyl. Friendly factions refusing to capture empty positions was a pretty common occurrence. An enemy AI would occasionally break, especially after reloading a save. And enemies would just stand there like it's business as usual while their buddy standing 5 feet away from them in their field of vision gets his head turned inside out by one of my bullets. And there were many others, including a pretty massive one in the final mission. But I'll talk more about that when I get to it. For now, we head to the swamps and get to work on capturing these positions. Clear Sky is a bit more open-ended in its gameplay than Shadow of Chernobyl, as you can capture the required locations in any order that you want, and the story takes more of a backseat to the Faction Wars gameplay. Until you reach Lamansk, that is. And this is where Clear Sky is at its best, because stalking is better than ever thanks to some nice engine upgrades. Bullets now have visible bullet tracers, which was huge for me. Just being able to see where my bullets were flying made the combat so much more clear, and allows you to readjust your shots for better combat success. Although pistols don't have the ability to aim down sights anymore for some odd reason. In fact, the alternate zoom probably made shooting pistols a bit easier if anything. But it's still odd though, because Call of Pripyat adds pistol iron sights back. So what gives? But moving on, the lighting system is pretty fantastic in this game. The shadows and light rays have gotten an upgrade and they look pretty great, even to today. And there's now an improved day-night cycle that makes the days brighter and the nights way darker. Seriously. Unless you have good night vision, this game is way harder at night because you literally can't see shit. But since you can't sleep or pass time, and the day-night cycle in this game is fairly long, it'll take around 48 minutes for night to fully pass. And if you don't have night vision, fighting in the dark is easily twice as hard as daytime shootouts. So you better get that night vision ASAP. As you explore the swamps and help Clear Sky take these renegades down, you'll notice that Scar is incredibly weak, even for a stalker character. The tighter gunplay that makes hitting enemies a bit easier has been offset by some pretty major changes to the bleeding system. Bleeding has been made much more punishing and resource intensive, as bleeds won't be fully healed unless you use around 3 bandages to fully heal. And I'm not sure if it's just me, but it seems bandage and first aid kit drops from enemy corpses have been reduced and traders only seem to have a handful of bandages in stock at a time, and I was strapped for bandages at pretty much all times. They also completely removed the color bleeding indicator, and now a small icon will flash next to your health bar, but there's no visual indication as to how severe the bleeding is from this icon. The only way to check how severe the bleeding is, is to literally look at how fast your health bar is depleting, hear how heavy your character's heartbeat sound effects are, or look at your feet to see how often blood splats down on your feet, which is a pretty cool visual feature at least. And unlike Shadow of Chernobyl, where bleeding would heal over time, Scar will continue to bleed freely until he gets properly bandaged. Seriously, does Scar have fucking hemophilia or something? This dude is leaky as hell, and he even starts bleeding from taking fall damage. This added passive damage fuckery extends the radiation too, which has been made way worse for some reason. To see if you're getting irradiated, you have to look at this radiation meter in the bottom right corner of your screen, and most times the Geiger counter clicking you'd expect any game with radiation to have isn't there. So in the beginning I was completely oblivious to the fact that I'd gotten a semi-lethal radiation blast to my big toe by wading through some swamp water, and was confused as to why my health bar was melting away. Radiation is a lot like bleed. And if you are more irradiated than what your suit can handle, you'll start taking damage until you cleanse yourself of these cancer particles, or you just keel over and die eventually. I'm not sure why these changes were made. Shadow of Chernobyl's bleeding system worked just fine, and Clear Sky's changes make it genuinely worse and pretty rage inducing at times, and this game had me fuming on a few occasions, especially in the early to mid game. I'm not really a fan of this game's overly punishing and resource gobbling bleeding and hazard changes, and it mostly just makes the overall experience more frustrating, and it de-incentivizes taking risks and engaging with combat or artifact hunting, as you'll get brutalized and have to burn most of your bandages and radiation cures just to not die an agonizingly slow death. These punishing mechanics can be offset by weapon and armor upgrades that are pretty powerful, but that shit ain't cheap, so you'll have to grind your cash up, and you'll probably lose a dozen quarts of blood in the process. But for now, let's get back to the story. Once I start a new game and successfully capture all the necessary positions, we can then move on to the cordon, and the game points you to the cordon by having you take this guide here. However, this is the game setting you up to get jobbed. The guide dumps you off in a tunnel right in front of a fortified military base that will, without fail, spot you and unload a mounted machine gun into your ass and kill you. I tried taking this machine gunner down and just running past, but no dice. I always get blown to pieces. I'm not even sure if it's possible to get past this checkpoint at this point in the game. So if you want to actually get into the cordon without getting instantly mowed down, 
we have to go back through the swamps and take the northeastern entrance into the cordon. I have no clue if this is the developer literally trolling the player, but I just could not get past this machine gun at all. So I think the devs are taking the piss here, especially because the objective marker points you right towards this death trap. But once we take the safe entrance and enter the cordon without getting turned into Swiss cheese, I head towards Sidorovich and the Rookie Village, and I take a little trip down memory lane, dodging the railroad checkpoint that's currently home to some hostile stalkers. A fun little callback to the original. I talk to Wolf and Sidorovich, and just like the first game, I ask Sidorovich about the stalker who was looking to buy some rare components. Old Sid gives us a classic tit-for-tat proposition, as a recent conflict has broken out between the local stalkers and the military, and Sidorovich isn't sure what happened but the stalkers have captured the local military commander and a case he needs for his client has gone missing within the chaos. So we need to figure out where that case is and maybe solve this stalker military beef. So we head on over to the North Stalker camp. At the camp, we speak to the stalker leader, Father Valerian, who gives us more context on the situation. Originally, the stalkers and military had a deal where the stalkers would bribe the military to smuggle goods out of the zone and provide them with information. And that was until the stalkers had found out the military had double-crossed them and gave their location information to bandits. And the military commander had even sold some stalkers into slavery. Jeez. So the stalkers got pissed, launched a raid on the military, and kidnapped the commander, leading us up to the current predicament. So we go talk to the commander, and he gloats about hiding the loot, and the conversation goes nowhere. So we return to Valerian who now has a plan to kill two of the commander's underlings to break his spear and get him to cough up the loot. And luckily for us, his underlings are lurking and stalking around here as we speak, so it's time to go out and mow them down. I take down the two military squads after two pretty tough gunfights and return to the stalker base, where the commander then immediately folds and tells us where the case is. And this is the typical structure of each area in this game. There will be a conflict you have to resolve with the local faction, and from there you can decide to join them if you want. Although the setups for these conflicts are pretty interesting, they usually get resolved so quickly, the story lacks any real impact, making these conflicts pretty forgettable as an unfortunate result. But anyway, we grab the case and return it to Sidorovich, who reveals that the stalker looking for the components was Fang from Strelok's squad, and he tells us to look for him at the garbage, so we head up north. Once I enter the garbage, I get stuck up by some bandits, who will take all your money if you let them. But this is a pretty interesting choice that Clear Sky is giving us. You can either let the bandits take all your money, or you can just kill them, but that'll make the bandits hostile to you for the rest of the game, making the garbage a pretty dangerous place. And I was not having that. So after I slaughter these checkpoint bandits after a few attempts, I head to my next objective and find a group of dead stalker prospectors. On one of the bodies is a message detailing that Fang had refused to pay the prospectors until he got all the components he needed. So they sent a guy named Vasya, or is it Vasyan? to try and negotiate with Fang. So our next goal is to find Vasya, or Vasyan, who we can find to the east of here, who is under attack from a pack of meat dogs. We help him kill off the dogs, and he tells us that he was tailing Fang into the dark valley before he got jumped by these bastards. So we make our way over there. Once inside the valley, we run into Freedom, who have shacked up in the dark valley for this game. We speak to the border guard, who tells us that the Dark Valley is currently under lockdown, as Freedom Stalkers are being attacked suspiciously often and efficiently, and it seems nobody can leave the base without getting killed, so the whole faction is on edge. We then head up to the Freedom base to learn more and try to find Fang. We talk to the Commandant, as we cannot speak to Freedom leaders yet, who asks us to kill a pseudo-dog that's been causing the base some serious trouble. This was the thing that was too much for you? Anyway, we return to the Commandant who gives us another task to deliver some ammo to an outpost. We get the ammo from this ridiculously voiced traitor. Hey buddy, what will you be needing today? And we head out. The outpost is only a short walk away from the main base, but while we're on our way we hear that the outpost has been attacked over radio, so we can keep the ammo. Nice. And we get a new task to investigate the camp. At the outpost, I find a PDA on one of the bodies that reveals that the Commandant is behind the recent attacks on Freedom's men, and he's been feeding the mercs information on Freedom movements and tactics. We then talk to Freedom's leader, Chekhov, who was pissed by the Commandant going all Benedict Arnold on his ass. He also said that he sold Fang some old parts not too long ago, and he will tell us more if we help ice the Commandant for him. We find the Commandant shacked up with some mercenaries, and I take him down with the help of some Freedom shooters, and I turn his PDA back into Chekhov, who is confused as to why the mercenaries are attacking Freedom. But put that thought on ice for a sec, because I need more info on Fang now. And luckily for us, Chekhov was intrigued by Fang's hunt for rare components, so he got a Freedom Technician to hack Fang's PDA and track his movements. Damn, nosy bastard. But that nosiness gave us our next best lead, and it looks like Fang went back to the garbage after the Dark Valley, so that's where we will go. Are you ready to help Freedom once again? Oh yeah, let me get back to you on that.
I follow Fang's location to a cellar where I get flashbanged and robbed by bandits for all my money and weapons. Fuck. But at least we find Fang's PDA telling us to head to Strelok's hideout under Agriprom. I then go get my items back from these shitty bandits. But the 13,000 rubles I had on me seemed to have vanished into the ether. Oh, 13 bands. All gone. All my apes are gone. But it's okay. Because the story will give us 10,000 rubles again as a reward very soon. And before I make it to Agriprom, I clear bandits out of this vehicle park and try to do some artifact hunting. But artifacts are much less common in Clear Sky than in the other Stalker games, and I think I only grabbed around 5 or so over the course of the entire game, because they are pretty far and few between, and I was heavily discouraged from artifact hunting due to the punishing radiation damage and just how easily the anomalies can kill you. It definitely makes artifact hunting feel like a really dangerous act, which was probably intentional. But since you die so quickly, the artifact hunting loses any intensity it has as the hunt eventually devolves into a trial and error grind of reloading saves until you can snag the artifact without getting killed in under a few seconds. Artifact slots are now also tied to your suit's capabilities, so instead of 5 slots, you'll likely have around 2 to 3, unless you have a pretty high end stalker suit. And all these combine to mean the artifacts have a greatly reduced role in Clear Sky, or at least in my playthrough they did. There is also one last issue I have with the combat that really starts becoming an issue around this point in the game. And that's the enemy's grenades. Holy shit, these bandits and monolith soldiers should have hooped instead of becoming stalkers. These guys are like 2015 unanimous MVP Curry with these grenades. Curry, way down to bang! Bang! Enemies seemingly have perfect accuracy with grenades, being able to perfectly throw grenades right at your feet every time from mostly any distance. And the only way to avoid taking grenade damage is to sprint to another spot of cover and hope you don't die from gunfire or the grenade itself. And since your only way to escape is a pretty clunky toggle sprint, you will die several deaths from grenade explosions. Guaranteed. Having these enemies be Ray Allen with their frags makes some fights excruciatingly hard, especially in the endgame when grenades are just raining down on you with perfect accuracy. It's just absolute misery. And it really hamstrings the enjoyability of Clear Sky's tighter combat, which is a shame really. I explore a bit more of the garbage before heading to Agriprom, where duty is currently shacked up. I join with the traveling duty squad to head to their base, and along the way we get ambushed by a bloodsucker, which I didn't realize was a scripted scene. But regardless, we make it to the duty base, and I talk to their commander, and I ask him how I can get to the underground, and he tells me that duty has been having problems with mutants swarming the area after a botched tunnel explosion opened up caverns that mutants poured out of. To fix this, we make a deal with duty. We will flood the underground mutant caves in exchange for access to the underground. We head over to the underground entrance and have to slaughter some snorks who come rushing to the surface. Snorks are some bastards in this game, they can two shot you and inflict some nasty bleeding with their claws, and they move pretty damn fast. It's still just aim for the head and hope for the best here. Once they're killed, it's a pretty quick trip through the underground, and we've got to spray down a controller in the main pump room, just like old times. We turn the pump and make our escape, and we make it to Strelok's old base, and we can find a PDA from Strelok himself, confirming that Strelok's group is causing the emissions by trying to reach the zone center, and it outlines his plan to get past the Brain Scorcher using Professor Sakharov's Psy Protector prototype that we use in Shadow of Chernobyl. Lebedev contacts us and tells us that he believes that if Strelok tries to reach the center again, he will create an emission so powerful it will essentially nuke the entire zone, and everything and everyone inside of it so we have to follow his trail to Yantar. I find my way out of the sewers, killing three meat ghosts on the staircase out of here, and I return to the duty base for that sweet 10,000 ruble reward. And I even join up with duty to see what would happen, because the factions are at their best in clear sky, and joining a faction will completely change how you interact with the world. In my case, joining duty made freedom hostile to me, which ended up making the game much more dangerous for me, as Freedom ended up controlling a few choke points into areas I couldn't get past for a while, but those were the consequences I had to deal with for shacking up with these zone cops. So I didn't really mind. It's around this time that emissions will start happening in the game world. Sometimes when you enter an area, you'll get a message that an emission is about to hit, and you have to find the nearest enclosed shelter to wait out the blowout. It's a cool in-game way to convey just how unstable the zone is becoming, but in execution, after the first emission, it mostly just exists to waste time. Each time I get an emission warning, I run to cover, and then just cruise my phone while I waited for the mission to end. And these emissions happen more often than you think they would, so you'll spend a decent chunk of time just waiting out the emissions. We make it to the scientist camp at Yantar, which is currently being swarmed by zombies. We take down the zombies and go inside to speak with Sakharov about Strelok. Sakharov tells us that he and Strelok made a deal to get the Psy Protection prototype in exchange for doing some field work for the scientists. Strelok then went to the Yantar factory and then subsequently disappeared. Hmm. If Strelok had already worked with Sakharov in the past, then why did he not recognize him as the Marked One in Shadow of Chernobyl? Sakharov must have been like, Damn, you look and sound really similar to another stalker who wanted the exact same Psy Protection prototype thing not too long ago. Is that your brother or something? But jokes aside, 
Sakharov then strikes a deal with Scar. A new map, a new deal with the local NPCs. Sakharov wants us to find some documents that some stalkers managed to pull out of the factory to the north. And if we can get those docs for him, he will get us into the factory so we can follow Strelok. We then find the documents behind a fence near the factory. The stalkers who had got the documents got brain blasted by the Psy waves here. We return the documents to Sakharov, and he tells us that the Psy missions are happening thanks to an issue with the emitter's cooling systems, and if we could fix it, it would be safe enough to pass through. So we link up with some stalkers the scientists hired, and we move to fix the cooling system while the Psy emissions at the factory are at their lowest. This mission is pretty complicated for a stalker game, and it's a very crusty mission because of it. Firstly, I had this gangrenous filter over my screen. Also, there's this audio distortion going on during the entire mission from the Psy waves, and it makes your allies' voices incredibly quiet and muffled. Our goal here is to cover our allies from a vantage point from zombies as they restart the cooling system, but you're far enough away that you'll be missing your shots way more than you'll be hitting them, so I burned a solid chunk of ammo doing this mission. Luckily, however, your allies seem invincible, and the zombies don't seem capable of stopping them. So I just took pot shots at them until the time limit was up, and once that was up, the quest was complete. But not before having to do it all over again because I forgot to save and then got clapped by a zombie when I wasn't looking. Damn. But when the mission is done for real, the path to the Red Forest and Strelok is open. Once in the Red Forest, Strelok calls us and tells us to stop chasing him. Whoa, this is some crazy protagonistception going on here. It's kind of trippy to have the guy we played as in the first game talk to us directly. But I just can't buy this voice for Strelok whatsoever. And his voice changes again in Call of Pripyat. <laughs> he just sounds too young and silly. End your pursuit now, mercenary, or you will die. Nobody with a widow's peak that powerful has a voice like that. And we chase him until he gets to a tunnel that he collapses behind him. And we get attacked by stalkers that I was not ready to take on. So I cut and ran for the time being. I need more gear. So I do a side quest in the Red Forest and take on a pseudo giant who has been buffed to hell and back since Shadow of Chernobyl. Instead of only needing two clips to the face to take this guy down, he can now take around eight or so clips to the face and can still do massive damage with a stomp attack. And these bums I'm escorting don't seem to be interested in fighting him at all. So I was only able to beat him by jumping up on this rock and spraying at him for a few minutes and lobbing all my grenades at his malformed ass. Glad I had this rock, or otherwise this mutant probably would have been unkillable unless I came back with an RPG. And even then, I probably end up only blowing myself up. But once I finish the mission and get a sweet new Vintar BC rifle and ammo, I return to the tunnel to find that the stalkers are no longer hostile to me. Huh. Maybe Strelok only hired them for a half an hour or something. But with the tunnel destroyed, our only way to Chernobyl is through Lamansk. But the bridge to Lamansk is raised and bandits have taken over the other side. So Lebedev tasks us with finding a man named Forrester, one of the few remaining people to have been in the area before the power plant disaster in 1986, who apparently has the uncanny ability to navigate through the zone. So we head off to pay him a visit. To find him, we have to jump through a time anomaly guarded by some ankle biters who hide in the bushes. Fuck these dogs. Once through the anomaly, we teleport to Forrester's house and we can speak to the man himself and ask him how to get into Lamotsk, a secret ghost city that used to house scientists that would later go on to form the sea consciousness. No, Lamosk is not a real place like Pripyat. I had to double check to make sure though. Forrester says that since the bandits were able to get on the other side of the bridge while it was raised, there must be another way to get there. But luckily for us, again, Forrester is aware via some radio signals that some stalkers have found a path near Lamosk, but have been caught in an anomalous loop. If we could free them, we'd be able to find a path to Lamosk and maybe recruit those trapped stalkers into helping us. He tells us to go to the military warehouses to learn more about the trapped stalkers, but before we do that, I decided to do a duty mission to clear out some bandits from a tunnel right outside Forrester's place. So I clear out the bandits and find this crazy looking artifact on a table. I pick it up and learn that it's the compass artifact, and equipping it essentially gives me unlimited sprint. Sweet. But now it's time to head back to the military warehouses. This is where my decision to join duty has come back to bite me in the ass, as the only path from the Red Forest to the warehouse is heavily fortified by freedom shooters who are fitted in exoskeletons. And these guys Stephen Curry-like grenade launching skills and minimal cover were just way too much for me. And after almost 20 minutes of what felt like me bashing my head into a concrete wall trying to kill these guys, I eventually just said fuck it, I'll take the scenic route, forcing me to take a hike back down through Yantar and Akraprom, then hook back up through the garbage to safely reach the military warehouses. <laughs> Don't join a faction unless you love hiking, I guess. I make it to the military warehouses and say hi to Freedom, who have every damn entrance guarded. But at least this entrance was less heavily guarded than the other one, and I can actually get past it. And I meet up with the other half of the looped mercenary squad. The mercenaries need to set up in the nearby water tower, but there's a big scary bloodsucker guarding the place, and these mercenaries are just way too scared to take it down. So I big bro these mercs and kill the bloodsucker for them. 
but there's actually two of them. The game is doing some trolling again, so watch out. But once the bloodsuckers are killed, I climb the tower to get the Merc's transmission, and we get more info on their whereabouts, so we return to Forrester. Luckily for me, the Freedom Thugs who were guarding the entrance to the Dark Forest had moved on to attack duty at Forrester's base, which allowed me to sneak back to Forrester's place, and I let the Dutyers posted there kill off these invading dickheads for me. Thanks, guys. We speak to Forrester again, who says that he could get the mercenaries out if only he had his trusty compass artifact. Oh, you mean the one I picked up a little while ago in the bandit tunnel? Already ahead of you, bro. Here you go. It's actually pretty cool that I was able to grab the compass ahead of time, and that it's persistent in the world from the start of the game, and I didn't have to clear out the same tunnel twice. Nice. And for our hard work, the Forester gives us the best reward I've ever gotten in the Stalker series. A custom Vintar BC rifle with 50% added accuracy and magazine size. And this gun carried me through the rest of the game, and I cannot stress enough how huge the improved accuracy was. And without it, the game's final stretch may have literally been unplayable. Get your upgraded weapons, kitties. Once we're done with Forrester, we head back to the military warehouses again, and I take out these military guys who are hiding out here, and I turn on the tower transmitter, and we hear the mercs finally escape from the loop, so we head back to the bridge to link up with Lebedev. And on my way back, I take down this bandit warehouse, but this buggy ass door was closed tight, so I eventually just had to move on as there was no way to get inside. And then make a quick stop at the duty HQ to get some more ammo for this bridge battle, and I meet up with Lebedev. It's now time to lower the bridge and get into Lamansk. This is a bit of an odd mission for Stalker, as it's probably the most traditional shooter style mission I've seen in the series yet. We have to snipe the bandits from across the bridge, and cover the mercs we helped free as they lower the bridge for us. To get the bridge to fully lower, we have to cover the merc lowering it by killing four snipers who come over the hill. This battle... kinda sucks. The snipers will kill the bridge lower very quickly after they come over the hill, and the game can get easily bugged and stuck if he's killed, as a new merc won't move in to replace him. Also, the bridge is part of this large crane, and the bars of the crane block sight on the hill a bit, and these snipers will always seem to try their hardest to use the crane as cover and wriggle their way into the worst spot possible, and I had to reset several times before I finally succeeded by killing all four of them without letting them kill the merc once. If not for the Forester's Vintar, this battle would have been much more difficult and frustrating. Stalker does not excel at Call of Duty style shooting galleries like this, but this isn't the worst of it. Just wait. Once the bridge is lowered, the path to Lamansk is now open. But be careful, because if you move on to Lamansk, you will not be able to return to the rest of the zone. So don't enter the tunnel until you are fully prepared. Otherwise, you'll find yourself far too overextended with no way to go back outside of loading a pre-Lamansk save. And no, the game does not make any indication that this is the point of no return. So just be very careful. And after stocking up for the final battle, I head into Lamansk. Lamansk is very similar to Pripyat in the Shadow of Chernobyl, being a fairly straightforward combat gauntlet where you have to shoot through heavily armed monolith forces. It's another tough as nails endgame fight, but you really start to get beat down once you get to this half-built building full of monolith thugs. They have the high ground on you and will lob grenades at you from a huge distance with Reggie Miller tier accuracy, and these grenades will flush you out into radioactive pockets and terrible positioning. It's absolutely miserable. If not for these grenades, this probably would have been a pretty solid ranged gunfight. But as it stands, it's just a crushing exercise in trial and error. And I was only able to progress because half of the monolith soldiers AI crapped out and they just didn't react to getting shot at. And they just stood there watching all their allies die from bullets to the brain. And once past the construction yard, we have to fight through these narrow corridors full of monolith snipers and machine gunners. This game has fully evolved into the stalk of duty by now. Trial, error, a bit of determination, and some well-placed saves are what you will need to win here. And you just gotta slog it through. But this one part where your clear sky allies cover you as you run from cover to cover was pretty cool. Once past these machine gunners, you then have a boss fight with a military helicopter, complete with its own boss health bar. And this boss battle with the helicopter is crusty as all hell. I would peek out of cover, spray at it with my Vintar, and then hide before the chopper lasered me to death. I had to shoot at some real scuffed angles to take this helicopter down, as it seems the chopper is able to kill you from anywhere if you're at all exposed. But luckily it doesn't take too many bullets to go down. And after one more meat grinder gunfight, we finally reach the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. We are then forced into a final battle with Monolith and Strelok. We spawn in on a power plant catwalk armed with a Gauss rifle, and our goal is to shoot Strelok enough times to disable his side protection before he can reach the sarcophagus. In this final mission, it's probably the biggest piece of dog shit in the entire Stalker series. Holy shit, this section is unfathomably bad. As you go through the teleporters chasing Strelok, You'll have to fight monolith soldiers who spawn in both in front of and behind you, in areas with very little to no cover at all. And when they spawn in, your screen shakes like it's in a damn earthquake, and lining up shots is nearly impossible while the shaking is going on. And by the time I got here, my slog through the brutal combat La Mosca had drained me of all my healing items. So even if I survived an encounter, I'd usually just end up bleeding out anyway. 
And the whole time that you're fighting for your life against powerful monolithian goons, Strelok is making his way to the sarcophagus. And if he gets there, it's game over, which happened to me, which forced me to restart the entire section. The only reason I was able to complete this final battle was because Strelok himself bugged out and he somehow fell off the Chernobyl catwalk and he just stood out there in the open like a statue. So all I had to do is just shoot him until his health bar was fully depleted. Now this is the actual biggest bailout I've ever gotten from a video game, as I highly doubt I could have completed this normally. But since this last section is so janky and bullshit, I didn't even care. But once Strelok has taken 20 Gauss Rifle Blasts to the face, a cutscene plays where even though Strelok was stopped, another omission happens anyway, and Lebedev, Scar, and the rest of Clear Sky are seemingly totally wiped out by it, as these characters are never seen alive ever again. We then cut to a hallway full of catatonic stalkers being brainwashed and recruited by the Sea Consciousness, and we see Strelok in his iconic stalker tattoo, leaving us off where Shadow of Chernobyl picks up. This story had a lot of potential to expand further on the zone, the emissions, and the sea consciousness, but we end up not knowing anything we already didn't know by the end of Shadow of Chernobyl, and we don't get any solid resolution as to what happened to Clear Sky and the main characters. I guess they all ended up either dead or mindless monolith shooters. Clear Sky's kinda got the Bethesda narrative problem of a good setup that isn't fleshed out enough which leaves the overall story and characters feeling like a bit of a missed opportunity. Each area has an interesting setup and problem to solve, and Clear Sky definitely does the most with its factions in the series. But these conflicts are resolved very quickly after a few short missions, like when the Stalkers were at a stalemate with their captive commander, only to get him to fold instantly after we quickly wipe out two military squads. And we know that Lebedev was one of the original Chernobyl scientists, and he knows about the Noosphere and that the zone is man-made, but he sort of just writes that off and says, you gotta just trust me on this shit, man. And the game just ends up leaving a lot of story threads unresolved. And I get it, obviously we don't want to learn everything about the zone and have it lose its mystery. And since we know where exactly the story needs to go for Shadow of Chernobyl to happen, not learning anything new or interesting about the zone just makes the whole story seem a little pointless, as the game leaves many plot threads and character fates unresolved, even to this day. But with that, that's Stalker Clear Sky complete. It's a pretty mixed bag in my opinion. On one hand, it's got some pretty great updates and enhancements to the game, the combat is tighter and visually clear, and weapon upgrades, faction wars, more robust stalker camps and bases, graphical and lighting upgrades, and the myriad of UI improvements and new artifact hunting mechanics are all great new additions to the series. But the game's overly punishing bleeding, high number of bugs, grenade lobbing accuracy that makes broke Slavic bandits look like Steph Curry, and the brutal late game combat gauntlet really box Clear Sky down for me. But overall, these new features, expanded mechanics and enhancements still make the game an overall worthwhile experience. And I still recommend this game to any stalker fan at only $10. But hold on, seems I'm getting a call. So let's take a look at a final game in the trilogy, for now at least. Stalker, Call of Pripyat. Call of Pripyat dropped about a year and a month after Clear Sky. GSC Game World was on a bit of a tear in the late 2000s, dropping three Stalker games in three years before going completely radio silent for the next 14. But we might be so back real soon. Call of Pripyat was a game that surprised me a bit, as it takes a much more open-ended approach to exploration and mission structure, making it feel truly unique compared to its predecessors. So let's pick up that phone and get right into it. Call of Pripyat starts not with a low resolution cutscene, but rather a classic Fallout style narrated slideshow. All it's missing is the Ron Perlman voiceover. It mostly exists to get players back up to speed with the story, recapping the 1986 meltdown, the creation of the zone, the origin of the stalkers, the plot of the first game, and so on. Call of Pripyat's story is about Operation Fairway, a special military operation if you will, Glory to Ukrainian fighters. It's at the center of the zone in attempts to secure and find out the truth about what's going on at the Chernobyl MPP after Strelok turned off the brain scorcher. However, despite careful planning and even preparing some anomaly maps, the operation was a massive failure, and all the helicopters sent into the zone crashed from unknown causes. In this game, we play as Major Degtyrev, a Ukrainian security service agent who was sent to the zone posing as a stalker to learn about what happened to Operation Fairway and to look for any survivors. I really like this new perspective for our main character. Playing as a soldier for a faction that has up until this point been nothing but wholly hostile thugs is a nice shakeup for a stalker plot, and it gives us more context and perspective on how the military is reacting to the zone, which is great for world building. Once the intro slideshow is over, the game wastes no time and dumps you right into the zone, with objectives to find and analyze the helicopter crash sites. I open my PDA to get the lay of the land. The map UI has been improved even further, with an even bigger and more detailed map screen to use, along with some extra screens for player stats and world messages. It's probably the most simplified PDA yet. Looking at the PDA, you'll notice that Call of Pripyat only has three maps, another departure from the usual 9 to 10 maps you get in the first two games. These three areas are Yanov, Zeton, and Pripyat itself, which is unavailable until around two thirds into the game. 
These areas are pretty sizable, being around two to three times larger than areas of the past. And each map contains several marked points of interest, these being abandoned buildings, camps, and anomalies. It may be a bit disappointing at first because of the absence of class or stalker areas like the Cordon, and Yanov and Zaton have a bit of a samey vibe to them. But the reduced load zones really help to remove the slogging stretches of the game, and these maps are so dense, it's still around the same amount of content with only a third of the maps. So I strike out into the zone, and I get the location of this area settlement from some passing stalkers, and head over there to get my bearings. This place is Skadovsk, a settlement built out of a rusting barred ship, which is a really cool setting for a stalker camp, and it meshes perfectly with the world. You also now have the ability to sleep, since stalkers regain the ability to sleep after Strzok destroyed the sea consciousness. So you can just snooze those darkest fucking scary nights away. Unlike that hemophiliac with insomnia mercenary scar. Just make sure you have enough food on you for some breakfast when you wake up, as hunger will build as you sleep. But it's no real issue, and food drops are more plentiful than ever. And I always had a solid stock of Slavic diet staples in my inventory. I say hi to some of the local stalkers. Hello. I talk to the technician, who operate the same way they do in Clear Sky. But technicians now need rare tool items to unlock most upgrades, which have to be found out in the zone. And each map has a technician, so you have to choose which technician you'll want to give your tools to based on which area you'll be spending more time in. And design choices like this, although small, really reinforce this game's open-ended design well, and really motivates you to go out and explore. You can also pick up a slew of side quests here in Skadovsk. For example, I took this quest to get this stalker stash back that fell into a crack in the earth created by an anomaly. I carefully make my way to the bottom of the ravine, grab the stash, and fight Snorks as I climb my way back out. And once back at Skadovsk, I give the stash back to the stalker, and we get our reward by divvying up the stash between the two of us. This was a super cool way to get end quest loot, and you can choose to get an advanced pistol, medical supplies, an AK-74U, an artifact, and a helmet. But since I'm such a nice guy and totally not a spineless pushover, I only take the medicine and the artifact. Also while I was out gathering the stalker's stash, I reached one of the helicopters to give it a solid look over. And we learned that the electronics on the helicopter got completely burned out. Interesting. But I'll need more info. I then do a quick quest for the bandit leader Sultan here, and you can always tell which NPCs are important, because they have custom models that don't really match the other stalkers. Sultan wants to cap some of Beard's stalkers, Beard being the leader and bartender of Skadovsk, who seems perfectly content to let bandits live in his camp and actively plot in his downfall right in front of him. I let the bandits do most of the shooting and they end up getting themselves all killed, canceling the quest. This just being one of the possible results of this quest. As even though the game doesn't tell you directly, you can tip off Beard and his guys that the bandits are planning to attack him, and you can join the stalker side instead to kick the bandits cheeks. The player choice options in Call of Pripyat are surprisingly robust, and many quests have many ways to complete and resolve them, and this is just one. I get another quest from some stalkers to find someone named Magpie, who had robbed and left the stalkers for dead against a powerful mutant. And this quest ended up becoming way longer and deeply tied to other side quests in a way that I did not expect which I'll talk more about later. But for now, we gotta find the rest of the helicopters. And the next one I try to find is currently on top of an unclimbable plateau, so I have to speak to a local guy named Noah to reach it. But before getting Noah's help, I go and find the second helicopter crash near some electric anomalies. Dektyrev learns that the helicopter's crew was killed in midair, and the helicopter just simply crashed because corpses can't operate helicopters. We also find some maps of the area that can lead us to Yanov. I then go artifact hunting for some nearby electric artifacts, and I think artifact hunting is at its absolute best in Call of Pripyat. There are now many more anomalous sites on each map where artifacts spawn in. Detecting anomalies and bolt throwing are pretty much unchanged from Clear Sky, but Call of Pripyat which I'll be calling COP from now on, has made hazards much less punishing than in Clear Sky. You can actually enter anomalies and approach artifacts without taking a lethal blast of radiation poisoning directly into your ball sack that'll kill you in under 10 seconds. As the radiation system seems to have been reverted back to how it worked in Shadow of Chernobyl. Later on, you can even work with scientists to set up scanners at anomalous sites, and you can check for anomalies right on the map, really streamlining the artifact hunting process. And I think I collected the most artifacts in this game out of any other. Also, the emissions are back, but now they'll actually do something, and the emissions will actually reset the artifact spawns, so you'll always have an opportunity to collect artifacts for those sweet, sweet rubles. It's pretty great. Also, pressing O will pull your scanner out under any circumstances. Thank God. But for now, let's get back to the main quest. When we reach Noah's rusted ship house, he greets us by opening the door with a shotgun blast, which is a little touch that I love, and it really surprised me the first time. Once he blasts open the door, we can approach him and ask him to lead us to the plateau. I ask him how to get to the plateau, and we travel with him to this anomalous area, where we have to follow his steps and then jump into a space anomaly to get to the plateau. Noah's dive here is hilarious. Once up on the plateau, we examine the helicopter, which you find had double engine failures, along with three locations for possible evacuation sites for the stranded soldiers. One of the points is at Skadovsk, and no soldiers were loitering around there. 
so that can't be it. But with the rest of my objectives pointing me towards Yanov, I decided to head there. To get there, we gotta talk to Pilot at Skadask. Giving him the mass we found will give us a permanent discount on traveling between the two areas. Only a band of rubles per pop. Getting fleeced here. The price is not too bad considering how plentiful artifacts are, but I still wish there was an option to just walk between the areas like in the previous games. But this pilot tax on fast traveling is here to stay. So I cough up the cash to this human silt strider and we head to Yanov. Once in Yanov, I waste no time and strike out to find the other helicopters and evacuation sites and head west to this building that's crawling with stalker zombies, who I mowed down. I haven't mentioned the combat yet, and that's because Zaton and Yanov are fairly peaceful places in the beginning, and coming off clear sky, these places almost seem too peaceful. You'll mostly be fighting the occasional mutant and stalker zombies, and the factions, even the bandits, will be passive to your existence unless you deliberately piss them off. The combat is pretty much unchanged from clear sky, but thankfully the devs decide to make the bleeding way less viciously punishing. It seems to have been reverted back to how it worked in Shadow of Chernobyl, it has a color indicator for severity again, and it heals over time again. It's so beautiful. Cop also adds some additional indicators for weapons and armor quality, which are nice quality of life features as weapon and gear definitely seem to be more brittle than in past games. And you'll be getting real chummy with your favorite technician for those repairs, which you can take advantage of with some quests. If you can complete a quest to get supplies for Nitro the Technician in Yanov, he will offer you free repairs for life, which is huge for keeping your ruble stacks fat. But back to the story. We find documents from the soldiers pointing us toward an evac site in Pripyat, giving us our best hope at finding our military guys. I then move to find another helicopter, which is on a landing pad behind a minefield, so you gotta watch your step. It's a little puzzle to get past the minefield, and I was able to pass it by moving from stick to stick, and a little bit of old fashioned trial and error. And once at the chopper, we're able to get the black box from it, and we have to bring it to a technician to crack it open. Once we get the box, we get this funny scene of mutants rushing us and getting blown to bits by the minefield. <laughs> this game is just packed with fun little moments like this. I love it. I return to Yanov and give Nitro my black box, which he says will take three hours to crack open. These waiting times to advance quests being a new addition in COP, and it's an extension of this game's open-ended nature. It's literally telling you to go fuck off and do side content in the meantime. I take another look around Yanov station, and I sell an artifact to the loud as hell barman. Come on over, bro! And I notice that both Freedom and Duty are living here in the station. What is the meaning of this? Duty and Freedom sharing the same roof? What is this nonsense? Hell's frozen over, cats and dogs living together, how did this happen? Well, it's still a bit tense between the factions, and you can turn in quests to ally with a certain faction, but you can't outright join either Duty or Freedom in this game. Rather, they serve more as an outlet for players to make choices and complete quests in certain ways, which I'll elaborate on later. But in COP, the factions have the most reduced role yet. While I wait for Nitro to bust open the box, I head off to the Jupiter factory to find the last down helicopter. It's a bit of a trek around and through the factory, and I get mauled by some psychic pseudo dogs. But once they're dead, I can inspect the helicopter to find it also had its electronics fried. And with that, we've examined every down chopper. And it seems like they got hit by some anomalous activity. But we won't learn more until we find any survivors. So we head back to Nitro to check in on the black box. And we give him 3,000 rubles for his hard work. From the black box recording, we learn that the survivors had all evacuated to Pripyat. And we need a way there. So we speak to Pilot. Pilot refuses to take us to Pripyat, saying he's far too busy with his current routes. I think bro is just scared though. I haven't seen his ass budge from this bar since we got here. <laughs> but regardless, he advises us to go back to the Jupiter plant to find any documents that can tell us about an underground route to Pripyat. So we 180 and head right back to Jupiter and go from document to document to document until we find the info we need. And we find that there is indeed an underground route to Pripyat. So I take the documents to Nitro who gives us a good summary of the situation. The Jupiter underground is filled with gas and mutants, so we will need a closed cycle respiratory system suit and a squad of buddies to take with us. And it's at this point where the game really opens up, as you'll have to complete quests to gather up your stalker squad, and you'll need to do a bit of artifact hunting to get your racks up to buy a SIVA hazard suit or something similar, which will put you back around 30,000 rubles. But to build our squad, we have to go talk to a stalker named Zulu up in his house tower thing. Every time we say something to Zulu, we also take a drink of vodka with him, probably only getting slightly buzzed off of these six shots that we're taking. Zulu tells us that we'll need three others for a full squad, but we can go with less if we're feeling brave. To find our brave volunteers, we'll need to ask the local stalkers to see if they know anyone who'd want to join us in our gas tunnel suicide mission. And you gather information on stalkers who could join your squad in a very similar way to Morrowind, by asking them and then following the leads they give you. The three stalkers we can recruit into our squad are Lieutenant Sokolov, Vano, and my favorite, Strider. Unfortunately, your squad mates will handle getting their own suits. Lieutenant Sokolov is one of the Operation Fairway survivors, and he will join us right away when we ask him to. Sweet. There's also another stalker here with him in the scientist's base, Gary, 
who needs two artifacts to end his contract with the scientist to be able to travel to Pripyat. I spent a decent amount of time looking for the two artifacts he needed, and found them after visiting a few anomalies and traveling between maps. But Gary isn't a squad mate, and he shows up in Pripyat later, which I was unaware of, and I thought Gary didn't join my squad because he bugged out, but I just wasn't reading closely enough. Next up, we can find Vano in Yanov Station, but he's currently indebted to some bandits after he got scammed into paying endless interest on a new stalker suit. I tell him I'll take care of his debt, and he gives me $5,000 to negotiate with the bandits, and he advises me to keep my weapon out around the bandits to force them to give me some respect. And I took this advice at face value, and looking back, I think Vano was supposed to be giving you bad advice here, as he's a pretty gullible and naive stalker. And when I rolled up to the bandits' base waving my blammer around in their faces, they eventually just opened fire on me. Oh whoops, but that's okay. After a friendly but stern talking to, I get the bandits to agree to forgive Vano's debt, and he joins up with us. Our last squad mate we want to grab is Strider, who we can find near the southeast of the map. Strider is probably the most interesting character in the entire Stalker series, and he's even heavily featured in the next Stalker Games trailers, so maybe we'll learn even more about him in the future. Strider is an ex-monolith soldier who had defected from the faction with his squad after Strelok destroyed the Sea Consciousness. With the Sea Consciousness destroyed, Strider and his men no longer heard or were controlled by the monolith, and they fled to Yana where we can find them camped out trying to figure out what to do next. Strider asks us to find him a safe place for him and his squad to stay, and our only option here is Yanov Station. But convincing its residents to let some ex-monolith fighters stay with them is easier said than done, as they are extremely reluctant and nervous that they may cause chaos or just shoot the place up, and I don't blame them. Stalkers only know monolith as insane, bloodthirsty killers that don't even act human. To get Strider to move in, you'll need to gain the trust of either freedom or duty. And to do that, you need to complete at least two of three specific side quests in a faction's favor. And those quests will require other quests to complete. So we got quests on quests to finish here to get Strider to come with us. To complete the first of our required quests, we first need to get a Svarog Detector, which is an advanced version of the already advanced Velez Detector. We can get this quest from the Trader Owl on the Skadav ship which I had trouble finding, as I was sure the scientists would give me the quest to build the advanced detector. They even say you need one for this quest, but they don't tell you how to get one, nor do they sell one. But regardless, once you talk to Owl, you'll need to find three Velas detectors to make the Svarag detector, which opens up the world for you to find them. No quest markers are here to help you. In fact, most side quests don't even have markers at all, and some only have general area markers. It really shows how committed this game is to its open-ended design, and it opens up the world for the player to come up with ways to find three detectors. You can buy them, find them in caches, loot them off exoskeleton equipped zombies, and you have a lot of options. And once you have the detectors, you hand them over to the technician at the field lab and wait about a day, and Al will give you a phone call about the detectors, and we can get one from the beard tender here. This detector is a beast, not only showing you where the artifacts are, but it'll also show you the exact positions of anomalies. This thing makes artifact hunting even easier, and it's super helpful even outside of artifact hunting. And I use this thing to get past anomalous areas all the time. Fantastic item. Now advanced detectors are nice and all, but the main reason we need this thing is to make a space anomaly visible to us at a nearby cooling tower. We approach the anomaly and several dutier corpses fall out of it, and we can find the corpse of Duty's founder himself, General Tachenko, and we can grab his PDA. And on his PDA, we can learn that Duty had been formed by Tachenko on purpose after he had sabotaged communications with the military HQ, possibly disillusioned with the military's incompetence and desire to stay in the zone and work for themselves. This PDA exposing Duty's military ties and also revealing the harsh truth about their formation. It's a pretty interesting reveal, but the narrative of Duty's founding is a bit clunky in its execution, and I didn't really understand what was going on until I looked over the footage and did research for this video. Well, regardless, I turn in the PDA to the duty commander at Yanov Station, and that's questception one of two complete. Okay. Our next quest is to expose Magpie and turn him into our faction of choice. To find Magpie, we don't have to look far at all, as there is this interesting critter named Flint hanging out at Yanov. When we speak to him, he will talk about finding maps from Zaton to Yanov for pilot, which uh, is what we did. So if you press him about how we found the maps, he'll get pissy with you and tell you to leave. Suspicious. But we can't accuse him until we do two more things that he will try to take credit for. The first thing we have to do is talk to a man named Grousk at Skadovsk, who is hunting for some missing stalkers. He tasks us with finding a missing hunter near an anomaly. At the anomaly, you're supposed to find a bloodsucker corpse to advance, but the marker didn't appear for me, which I'm still not sure was a bug or not. But no big deal regardless, as I eventually find the bloodsucker corpse in some bushes, and that triggers a call from Grouse, who is scouting a building to the north. We then sneak into the building with him and take out a few bloodsuckers. We eventually head down an elevator shaft and find the missing stalkers dead in the basement of the building. We continue on and have to sneak through a room full of sleeping bloodsuckers. And it's a pretty tense and another really cool moment. And I feel like we learn a whole lot about these bloodsuckers just by watching them snooze in their natural habitat. 
They sleep standing up, so they must have some thunder thighs and some powerful ass core muscles. We then escape the building and Grouse tells us to tell the other stalkers about the bloodsucker flop house that's nearby. I pass through this abandoned kids camp, and these drawings are not just random drawings. They're ripped straight from a real world dilapidated kids camp in the real world Chernobyl exclusion zone. It's super cool. I return to Beard and tell him about the suckers, and he tells us to talk to Owl about using gas to kill them. Giving Owl 2,000 rubles gets us some info on where we can find the gas, which is in a destroyed convoy on a bridge infested with anomalies. We can find two keys and documents for the gas in the first and last cars in the convoy, and we can use those keys to open a case containing the gas. The gas weighs 10 pounds, so make sure you have enough inventory space when you grab it. All that's left to do now is to put the gas in the pump station outside of the Bloodsucker building and kill any Bloodsucker stragglers. And with that, we have successfully choked those bastards out. And when we return to Yanov, Flint will now be yapping about a Bloodsucker lair he destroyed. Hmm, cool story, bro. But we can't convict him until we catch him in one more lie. That being finding the Oasis. The scientist will give you a quest to look into rumors about an Oasis in the zone where allegedly plants grow freely and there's a magical healing spring in it. Asking other stalkers about the Oasis won't get you very far, as they'll either dismiss it as nonsense or make up some crazy story about it to fuck with you. To find the Oasis, we have to enter this side building near the ventilation complex and progress through a space-bending puzzle to find the Oasis. The goal here is to pass through the correct pillars to open the path forward, otherwise the area will loop on you. This puzzle isn't too bad, however, as if you pass through the right area, sparks will light it up on your next loop through. So just try again and again until you get it right. And once inside, we find the Oasis, a rare artifact hanging off of a tree that I struggled to grab for a bit. But once I'm able to jump up and grab it, we can return to the scientist who gave me 7,000 rubles for my work. Come on, man. This thing was an urban legend up until five minutes ago. You can't give me at least 10K for this joint? Scientists fleecing me aside. With the Oasis found, we can again return to Yana where Flint is again yapping about finding the legendary Oasis. We press him one last time and now we have all the evidence we need to detain his ass. But to get Strider to join, do not report it back to the Skadov stalkers the map is pointing at. Rather, report him to the duty commander, and doing that will finally make duty friendly to us. And we can finally convince duty to let Strider and his guys stay. We tell Strider the good news, and we head back to Yanov together. And I'm finally able to recruit him and complete our squad. These quests are surprisingly intricate and robust. And recruiting Strider is a pretty tough thing to do. As you can easily report quests to non-faction stalkers and miss out on befriending freedom or duty due to just how open-ended the game is. It's pretty awesome to have such freedom, but it also comes at the cost of quests being pretty unclear at times, and having to take a quick look at the wiki to prevent burning lots of extra hours may be needed if your brain has holes in it like mine. This design really lets the game have potential for tons of replayability for different outcomes and rewards, and I feel like no two cop playthroughs are really the same. But with my squad gathered, my SIVA suit equipped, and my ammo stocked up, it's time to head underground and make for Pripyat. Our squad readies up. Uh, you might want to put on your helmet, Dick Tyrev. And Nitro opens the gate up for us fast as fuck. Once inside, our squad just has to progress to the end of the tunnel and neutralize any opposition along the way. You fight these oversized rats, who I gotta say are ballsy as hell for just trying to bum rush five heavily armed goons. That's true bravery that you rarely see these days. The snorks are much more of a problem, and there's a ton of them in these tunnels. So just remember the number one rule for stalker success. Aim at the dome. And I was struggling with these guys for a bit, especially when I was not trying to shoot my own squad mates, who can easily get killed if you aren't careful, which will change the ending based on who lives and dies, which is a super cool open-ended aspect of this game. Just take Zulu here for example. On a few saves he actually died on me, but on my successful save he managed to survive. Later on you can find Zulu in Pripyat, and you can rescue him from a platoon of snorks or leave him to die, and if he survives both of those encounters, you will get a good ending for him. It's fairly small in the grand scheme, but it really shows you how dynamic this game is, and I think it's a really good direction for the Stalker series to be more consequential and reactive to the player's actions on these smaller stories and characters in the game. The game could have easily just scripted your squadmates to be invincible, or just be scripted to die at a certain time, but it reacts to how you handle the situation and leaves it up to you to get the best ending. Also, while you're traversing the tunnels, your squadmates will chat amongst themselves and react to incoming dangers. And it's really great at endearing these characters to me, and is what stalker stories need more of in my opinion. Just small things like Vano being frightened by the mutants go a long way in making these guys feel more real. We then come into this large circular room and have to access a control panel to get the door open. The Svarag detector coming up huge and helping me dodge the nearby anomalies. Once we get the power back on, we get attacked by our old pals the Monolith. And it seems even after the sea consciousness has been destroyed, Monolith troops continue to fight on, maybe all that time being mind controlled by the sea consciousness and getting psychic brain melting waves blasted directly into the dome has permanently damaged their minds, and now they're fighting even harder to try and reconnect to the monolith, which I think is a very interesting idea. But I'm just speculating here, maybe we'll learn more about this in the future. 
But for now, it seems besides Strider and his men, these monolith thugs are as violent and fanatical as ever. It's a pretty tough fight. Monolith are still strapped to the teeth, but I managed to take them down with all my squad mates still breathing. And once Monolith are toast, it's not much longer through a few straggler zombies until we take a ladder to surface at Pripyat. Once there, we get a cutscene where we are pressed by a squad of Ukrainian soldiers, and Dagtyarev is forced to reveal his identity as a major in the USS, and asked to speak with Kowalski, the leader of what remains of Operation Fairway. Zulu isn't happy that we're an undercover military man and buggers off in a rage, and the rest of my squad doesn't really care that much. So we all head to the evac point together, which is an old laundromat in Pripyat. This cutscene is crusty as all hell, but it's just so charming to me. I love it. And I don't give a rat's ass who's working for who. At the laundromat, we meet with Kowalski, who theorizes that the helicopters were shot down by some sort of unidentified weapon, and he tells us that they've been seeing monolith fighters with said unidentified weapon, and they want to capture it to figure out if this is our chopper slayer in question. So we move to ambush monolith at a nearby hospital. But before we go, we can get free ammo and technician services from the military, which reset after you complete missions, so you can do this multiple times. Sweet. Because being a government agent really pays off sometimes. These benefits are elite. But this is also the game telling us that it'll be some pretty heavy combat from here on out, and you'll be needing the ammo. So I link up with the army and ambush our monolith victims. But before we can investigate the bodies, monolith pulls a Uno reversal on us and ambushes us in return, having used those men as bait to light our asses up. Leading them is a monolith preacher holding the weapon in question, and there's a bit of a dramatic irony going on here. We as players know that that's a Gauss rifle, so it's funny to work backwards as Dektyrev to figure out what it is and how to use it. To get the gun, you need to kill the preacher, who's delivering the world's most deadpan sermon of all time. May your light shine down on the souls of the brave soldiers who gave their lives in service to your will. And that's another cool thing about Monolith, as they all speak in flat, emotionless voices. Even Strider does. Maybe a side effect of that Monolith control is that your emotional processing centers in your brain get fried. And even with the C consciousness gone, that doesn't mean the Monolith truths get to go back to normal completely unscathed. It's an interesting detail, and I'm fiending to learn more. Hopefully Stalker 2 has the answers. But once we take down the Preacher with a few shots to his thick skull, he takes a pretty funny and long fall, and we can then grab his Gauss Rifle, albeit a broken version of it. We show the Gauss Rifle to Kowalski, who is as stumped as we are, and tells us to find a technician who may know more about the weapon. But before our conversation ends, a distress call from the recon team comes in, and you already know Kowalski is tasking us with finding them. On my way out, I run into Gary. Yo, what's up, Gary? And he says that he has found a way to Pripyat, and he's here to offer us guide services back to Yanov or Jupiter, completely free. What a classy guy. And if you completed his quest, he will give you a bubble artifact as a delayed reward. Sweet. I could kiss you, Gary. Hell, I could grab that firm stalker ass, pin you down, and... Wait, what, what the fuck am I saying? Anyway, I decide to first check in on the recon unit, who are all unsurprisingly dead. But fortunately, there's some data on their bodies pointing me towards the bookstore as where the monolith operations base is. The military then sends me some reinforcements to attack the bookstore with, and the reinforcements in question being Sokolov and Vano from my own squad, which is a hilarious little detail. We attack the bookstore, which is crawling with monolith shooters, but I don't mind. A stalker game isn't a stalker game unless you're fighting a small town's worth of monolith troops in the last third of the game. And inside the bookstore's central room, we can find the monolithians having a geek session in front of a tall spire made of garbage. This is some more really cool lore for monolith, as it seems they have begun building jury-rigged antennas in an attempt to recontact the monolith. It's more great stuff. I wipe out the geeking monolithians and examine the antenna, and Dagtyarev theorizes that monolith are being controlled by someone through the antenna, which may or may not be true. They were definitely being controlled in the previous games, but like I mentioned earlier, it's unclear if this monolith is still being controlled, or if the remnants are trying to re-establish contact with the monolith. Once done with the trash antenna, I return to Zaytan and talk to the drunker technician to learn more about the Gauss Rifle. When I bring the Gauss Rifle to him, he clocks out for a few hours, and I do the same to pass some time. Once he's woken back up, he tells us that he used to be an engineer working at the Jupiter plant researching Gauss Rifle technology and sends us there to find his research notes on it. And he also gives us a key card to get into the previously locked plant. Inside, we scrap with some zombies, which is light work. Until it's not, and we enter a large room with a pseudo-giant. Fuck. But luckily for me, there are ladders you can take to safely get out of reach of the giant. And I just sat up there, lobbing grenades and peppering him with an embarrassing amount of ammo to take him down. But it later turns out that you don't even need to fight the pseudo-giant. You can just follow the catwalks into the room with the technician's note and just leave from there. But hey, if I see a mutant, I just gotta kill it. I return to give the schematics back to the technician, and looking over my footage, I realize I just straight up forgotten to turn the documents in, and I never got to repair the Gauss rifle. I just looked the technician right in the mug, repaired my Vintar BC, and left. What the hell was I thinking? 
but the Gauss rifle is only required for one specific area, which I'll talk about soon. But for now, we can return to Pripyat with the Gauss rifle documents. We tell Kowalski about what we learned about the Gauss rifle, and it's clear that this is not our helicopter slayer, so he loses all interest in it immediately. Kowalski then asks us to find a missing soldier near the grocery store. When we investigate, I find the soldier shooting wildly around the room before turning the gun on himself and chin-shotting himself. We then get attacked by a controller, who is controlling the soldier, and it's a pretty cool moment to see the controller in action, and not just having the mutant violate my screen and speakers with his ear-piercing psychic damage sounds and his camera force-pull move. I barrel stuff my Vintar into his face and take him down. See ya! Our next goal is to find the entrance to the X8 lab, as we found a keycard for it alongside the notes for the Gauss rifle. I do a bit of exploring, and it's so cool to be able to wander around the real-life ghost city of Pripyat, and there's so much more to it than the fairly straightforward combat gauntlet it existed as in Shadow of Chernobyl. It's got plenty of large buildings to explore and pilfer, and some pretty cool and alien looking anomalies to check out. It's super awesome, and the place is just thick with an unsettling and dangerous atmosphere. Even 2009 graphics Pripyat manages to unsettle me. But to get to the lab, we have to activate the elevator mechanism at the top of the building. So to go down, we gotta go up. And along the way we have to clear out zombies and monolithians in some pretty tough close quarters combat. But once at the top, I turn on the elevator and run back downstairs. Once inside the lab, our goal is to find up to six documents detailing brain scorcher emitter technology and other info about the group that spawned the zone. But you only need one document to complete this quest, as even the labs are adhering to this game's open-ended design. Inside we can also find a picture of Lebedev from Clear Sky, and you can also find a document referring to other Clear Sky members Beanpolev and Suslov, confirming their close involvement in the zone's creation. Too bad they all got disintegrated or indoctrinated into a monolithian at the end of Clear Sky though. I would have loved to hear more about this place from the men themselves. The lab is a decently vertical maze of a place full of mutants and anomalies, most annoyingly the anomaly that picks items up and throws them at you. It's pretty hard to avoid the projectiles, and my only strategy was just to wildly run past these objects and hope I don't get killed by a mop bucket hitting my head at over 4,000 miles an hour. The absolute worst part of this lab is the room with the burrs. These lumpy, Jawa-looking mutant motherfuckers in black cloaks that can use the force to throw objects at you, and there's like four of them packed into this tiny room. And this is where the Gauss rifle is essential, as it's the only weapon that can efficiently kill these bastards. Your normal weapons will not work, and you can unload an entire mag into a burr's face and he'll brush it off like it was just a stiff breeze. I even looked it up, and apparently the burr's health is bugged and it regenerates so fast that it makes them impossible to kill outside of the room. These fuckers were violating me so bad, and I couldn't even find a single safe place to stand, inside and outside of the room, and I'd always be at risk of getting killed by force pushes. Also, they can drain your stamina on hits, and even rip your weapon out of your hands. Thanks! I eventually just threw in the towel and dipped out of the lab completely, missing out on the last few documents. But luckily for my lazy ass, the amount of documents you grab doesn't seem to affect the story or ending whatsoever. Maybe getting all the documents used to be a requirement to get a true ending of some kind, but was cut from development at some point. As besides the completionist aspect, there's no real reason to grab these documents, unless you really want to see those clear sky easter eggs. I leave the lab and return to Kowalski, who copes about how shit the operation has been, and tasks us with re-establishing communication with HQ, pointing us toward where he lost contact with some men who were trying to find the source of their jammed communications. We find the crew who, of course, are all dead, and I pick up an explosive charge off one of the bodies. I radio my army pals and they tell me exactly where the jamming is coming from. Nice. Lucky me. And it's coming from the kindergarten. I head over, I use the charge to open the front door, and now I have to dodge some anomalies that are all over the building. I use my anomaly dodging strategy of running real fast and hoping for the best, and I eventually find the jamming source, another monolithian trash antenna. I shoot at it to destroy it, and I fell into that trap of standing there dumbfounded on how to destroy this thing like with the seat consciousness hologram, only to realize that it takes a dozen or so bullets to break it. But with the junk antenna broken, we can finally speak to Ukrainian command again. I also find a soldier hiding in a fridge on the now accessible floor below me, and we teleport back to the military laundromat. We get a brief from Kowalski, who has made contact with HQ, who told him to stay put and await further orders. Classic. But then, a soldier interrupts us and says that they're tracking a mysterious signal that seems to be coming right for us. So we go out to find the source, and as I reach its location, it moves, I reach it again, it moves again. Kowalski tells us to come back and prepare for what is most likely a monolith assault, and we head back and wait for them to attack. Once back, we get a cutscene of someone entering the base, and he identifies himself as Strelok. Yo, what's up Strelok? It wasn't Monolith who was coming, it was the big man Strelok himself. What the hell is he doing here? Last I checked, he and the military were on an on-site level of beef. Also, his new voice here suits him much better than the generic hooligan voice he has in Clear Sky. I have information that will allow the army to take control of the zone and destroy it. 
Strelok says that he's here to give information to the army on how to control and destroy the zone, as it's pretty clear lighting up those scientists and vats did not make the zone go away. We talk more with Strelok, who drops a truth bomb on us, saying the reason that the helicopters crashed was simply due to them hitting anomalies, and the army was unaware that anomalies move around after emissions, and their anomaly map they prepared for the mission was outdated and useless. It's a surprisingly simple and straightforward answer that anyone who played Clear Sky could have figured out. We then talk to Strelok in our base, and that is one powerful widow's peak. Shit is stark. He tells us that Guide was the one who led the army here and helped him reach Pripyat. Huh. Seems Strelok's whole group is now pretty chummy with the military. The military gets some pretty serious rehabilitation in this game, as they go from only hostile enemies to some of the best friends a stalker could ask for. And even Strelok, who probably has over a dozen military kills to his name, is getting cozy with them. We wait on an omission for a bit, and once it passes, it's time to make our final move. And we speak to a very quiet HQ to arrange an evac helicopter for us. Major Degtyreb here. I read you. Good. As of this moment, you are responsible for completing Operation Fairway. Kowalski and the Stingray Squad will assist you. We will then have to fight our way through the streets of Pripyat to escape. I put on a helmet for night vision, as I had stupidly started this mission at 11.40pm in-game time, making this a complete night battle. And also it seems at this point, sleeping has been disabled. This evacuation is a lot like the tunnel mission, as you are fighting alongside NPCs, including Strelok and Kowalski, who both can die if you're not careful. And that'd be pretty crazy if Strelok can survive a monolith brainwashing and a mission and pull off the events of Shadow of Chernobyl, only to then die in a comparatively less dangerous gunfight. But I'm not gonna let that happen. That's essentially my past self, and I gotta protect him. We gotta fight our way through monolithians, mutants, and zombies. And the biggest threat is the monolith snipers that are all over the nearby buildings, who can one-shot you if you're out in the open for too long. So having a scoped weapon is essential for taking them down. It's definitely the easiest final battle in the Stalker series, as there aren't exactly a ton of enemies, and you have plenty of backup from the military. And compared to the final mission in Clear Sky, this feels like a literal walk in the park. Once you reach the choppers and evacuate, that's the end of Call of Pripyat. You'll get another Fallout-style ending slideshow that shows what happened to the characters and how what missions you did or didn't complete affected the zone. But in broad strokes, Degtyrev turned down a promotion to remain as a field agent in the zone, seemingly not finished with the place and wanting to fight back against its spread. Since we destroyed the Bloodsucker Lair, Skadas was able to thrive as a stalker settlement. Nice, nice. The bandits started using the Oasis as a front to scam Clue as stalkers. Uh, not quite as nice. Zulu survived and eventually rose up to the status of a duty commander. Vano became a guide for scientists. Sokolov continued his work as a helicopter pilot. And after getting shot down and surviving another crash, he decided to say fuck this shit and joined a civilian airline. Good choice. Noah raised a small army of pseudo-dog puppies. Strelok passed his knowledge on to the government and worked as a consultant for scientists researching the zone on a large scale. I guess his endgame wasn't the zone's destruction. It was getting a bureaucratic advisory job. <laughs> Humble guy. And lastly, Kowalski managed to avoid taking the fall for the failure of Operation Fairway, and left the army with an honorable discharge. And with that, that's my Call of Pripyat complete! This game is a great entry into the Stalker series that gets a lot out of its open-ended design and player agency. Although I think this is by far the easiest game in the series, and sometimes a little bit too easy, as you'll go fairly long stretches with minimal combat occasionally. And the story is a bit loose and overall unimpactful in the greater Stalker plotline. This game is just jam-packed with cool moments, cool places to explore, artifacts to hunt, and it has a slew of quest lines that layer onto each other and promote a ton of replayability by allying with different factions and turning in quests and tipping off info to certain characters for different rewards and outcomes. The overly punishing mechanics in Clear Sky have been mercifully dialed back to create the Shadow of Chernobyl-esque experience that I enjoyed much more. And all that combined with the modern engine upgrades and the super awesome fully explorable Pripyat area just make this a great stalker package. But with that, that's every official stalker game reviewed in overextended detail. Now this is the Owen Kung channel, so you know I gotta rank these bastards real quick. Let's get it. Last place in my pick for the worst game in the series, we got Clear Sky. The Faction Wars is a great idea for a stalker mechanic, and it makes the world feel dangerous, dynamic, and alive. And it has a solid foundation for a story that ultimately falls short of its potential. And the engine upgrades and other quality tweaks do a lot for the moment-to-moment -moment enjoyment of the game. But the large number of bugs, overly punishing bleeding and radiation mechanics, and the absolutely miserable final stretch of this game keep me from ranking it anywhere but last. And in second place, and in the middle of the pack, we got Call of Pripyat. It's got a ton of replayability, and it's by far the most open and player-impacted stalker game yet, and it perfects many features like artifact hunting and combat, making them the best they've ever been in the series. 
and it has a ton of quests that are deeper than you think and build off each other in pretty interesting ways. But the loose and unimpactful story and lots of time loss trying to advance a quest with only some oblique directions can bog down the experience a bit. But these are all pretty minor issues. And besides that, this is an excellent stalker game. And in first place, the best, and the one that started it all, we got Shadow of Chernobyl. Oh, the most celebrated game in the series is the best. Shocker. But for me, it's just the most complete stalker package. I love the story on offer here. The zone is endlessly fascinating and I think the atmosphere is best captured in this game. It has some of the best levels like the labs, and the final Chernobyl nuclear power plant interiors were fucking rad. No pun intended. And despite the crappy engine and the less refined features, this is still the best way to experience stalker. And if you were to play one of these games, play Shadow Chernobyl. I think it's also got the most mods too. But with that, that's all I got for you today. I'm very glad I decided to play this series. It's a truly unique experience and has one of the most fascinating settings in gaming, even to this day. So thank you to all the commenters who yelled at me to play this. You did me a solid. But with all that yapping over, and it's a lot of yapping, it's like two hours, I'll wrap this video up and thank you once again for watching. And I hope you enjoyed this one, because I enjoyed you watching it. Goodbye. I'll do an anomaly video if you guys like this one. I promise.